Okay, it is uh, 5.30 p.m., uh, March 11th, 2019. I'd like to call the uh, Moorhead City Council meeting to order. Madam Clerk, may I please get a roll call? Shelly Dahlquist. Here. Sarah Watson-Curry. Here. Shelly Carlson. Here. Heidi Durand. Here. Mayor Jonathan Judd. Here. Joel Paulson. Deb White. Here. Steve Gertz. Here. Chuck Henriksen. Here. May we please stand and give the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Then we will proceed to agenda amendments. Mr. Mayor, um, there are two agenda amendments. Number 15 will be taken off consent. And the minutes, because they're on consent, there was a revision, so I need to note it now. Number nine from the minutes from last month, for the minutes from last month, it stated um, that was the Epic Company um, access agreement. It stated that Council Member Gertz abstained from the, the, the discussion and he did. However, it should say that he recused himself from the discussion and he left the chamber during the discussion. Okay, so we will make that change if that's okay. Oh, cool. Point of fair clarification, did you mean item 15 or 16? I meant the minutes from last month. No, for Oh. For taking off the consent oh, agenda. Council Member uh, White, I think you... 16 was the one that I requested. 16, I'm sorry. That's yep, okay. They've all changed. They keep yep. doing that. <laughs> so, okay, so my note, so it's actually number 16. Off yes. consent, yes. Okay. Okay, is there a motion to approve the agenda with the amendment so noted? Second. Okay, so the motion has been made by Councilmember Watson Curry, second it just because I can hear okay. Councilmember White more, I'll give her the second. Am I loud? Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, not. I'm not saying that. Uh, all in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Then there are items related to the consent agenda. Uh, those uh, items marked with an asterisk are listed and will be adopted with one motion. And I believe we've just only removed one item. So is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? And change the minutes, excuse me, oh, thank from you. last month. And with changing the minutes from last month with uh, City Manager Volker's. So moved as a minute. Second. A motion has been made by Councilmember Hendrickson, seconded by Councilmember Carlson. Please signify your approval by stating aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, item number five, recognitions and presentations. And I believe I'm coming down for the proclamation for National Kidney Month. Father is currently suffering from renal failure. So this is something that I believe we all need to pay very close attention to. Uh, so I believe that the awareness is very critical. So thank you. So I'll read the official proclamation. City of Moorhead, State of Minnesota. Whereas there are an estimated 30 million Americans with kidney disease, and most don't know they have it. Therefore, it is critical that attention be brought to this often overlooked but increasingly common disease whose major risk factors are diabetes, high blood pressure, a family history of kidney failure and over, and over age 60. If left untreated, kidney disease can lead to kidney failure. Whereas <clears throat> the month of March is National Kidney Month and March 14, 2019 
is World Kidney Day. The National Kidney Foundation, the leading patient-centric organization in the U.S. dedicated to the awareness, prevention, and treatment of kidney disease, is calling on all Americans to heart their kidneys and their overall health and get tested if they are at risk. Now, therefore, I, Jonathan Judd, Mayor of Moorhead, in recognition of this important health observance, do hereby recognize March 2019 in the city of Moorhead to be National Kidney Month. In witness thereof, I have set my hand and caused the official seal of the city of Moorhead, state of Minnesota, to be affixed to this 11th day of March, 2019. Now next is the Gate City Bank Neighborhood Impact Program for 2019. Good evening, thank you for having us. My name is Sherry Smith with Gate City Bank. I'm the Senior Vice President of Relationship Banking and Development. I have with me Angie Fogel, our personal lender, right here, and Kawar Farouk, one of our personal bankers. A cornerstone of Gate City Bank's mission is to serve our customers and connect with our communities while providing a better way of life. Today, we'd like to speak about how the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative offered by Gate City Bank does just that. The Neighborhood Impact Program, as we call it, is a series of programs designed to work together to improve neighborhood quality of life and encourage investment in the city's existing neighborhoods. Gate City Bank we invest in the program has made a significant impact in the city's effort to maintain its affordable housing stock in addition to stabilizing neighborhoods. The City of Moorhead Neighborhood Impact Program is established for the City of Moorhead homeowners in order to encourage the preservation of their homes and to add to the long-term value and life of their property and neighborhood. We are thankful for this opportunity to help build a better way of life for our friends and neighbors who reside in the City of Moorhead. The Neighborhood Impact Program was originally made available to the City of Moorhead um, in 2005. Since then, over $6 million has been made available in low interest rate loans, helping more than 135 homeowners to make home improvement savings in over $600,000 in interest. This year, we are excited to have the opportunity to provide an additional $2 million to the City of Moorhead Neighborhood Impact Program to continue the revitalization initiative in the Moorhead community. Important details of the program are included on the handout that Kawar just dispersed. We'd like you to note the deadline to apply for the program is October 31st. Thank you again for having us, and at this time I'd like to answer any questions you may have about the program. Council? Councilmember Durand. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you for partnering with the city and and for your uh, generous donation. Um, I guess I do have one quick question. If you if you know off the top of your head, <coughs> how many? And you may have stated this. How many individuals have made home improvements uh, like in the last year? If you know that. You <laughs> In 2018, I believe we had five or six um, okay. community members uh, complete their loan. Um, in 2017, we helped over 60 okay. homes. Okay. So quite a dip last year. And this year, we're rolling it out much earlier in the year, okay. so that'll have a significant impact, we feel, as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Council Member White. No question. I just wanted to also thank you and say, as someone who lives in an older neighborhood, you know, this is one of those great partnerships that I see as vital for our development as we see, you know, new families coming to our community and they're thinking about whether or not they can afford to buy an older home and do some work on it. Um, it's things like this that are really making that feasible and, and allowing us to welcome them to our community. So thanks. You're welcome. 
Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ah, thank you. Great program. Um, I hope more people take advantage of it. I have a question with the home of home evaluation. Um, can, it's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, what kind of home evaluation do they go through before they before a uh, person goes through the loan process? So there's there's two different loan valuations that can happen. I mean, you can do the city assessed value which we do do a, a loan eval with a realtor going out to do the property um, inspection. Um, if we do a, um, appraisal, then we can go up to 90% loan to value. So that would be a full on inside the house, everything checked out. Okay. And then the credit qualifications, just normal credit qual qualifications for just a loan? Correct. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Council Member Watson Curry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to echo the gratitude that's up here already and say I was a proud uh, applicant and so we're working on finishing our <coughs> home improvements for our little one in addition to the family. So it is a really great program. You get to work with both the city staff and um, the fantastic staff at Gate City. So thanks for all the work. <laughs> in addition to all the thanks and the wonderful support that we've gotten for Gate City, I'll note that our building codes folks go out as part of the loan evaluation to make sure that individuals um, address any safety issues that are in the home as part of the loan process. So it's not just about cosmetic things. We do take an opportunity and it, it provides um, a resource for people to talk with one of our building inspectors as part of this process too. So it really is a partnership with the community. So it's it's been a real rewarding experience for the homeowners that have gone through it. Anyone else? I'll let go what's already been stated. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for your investment in our, in our city. Uh, we have a lot of residents who are very proud of their uh, neighborhoods. So anything that could help enhance, we greatly appreciate it. So thank you, Gate City, your leaders, and your staff for investing in our city. Thank you very much. And I'll come down. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <coughs> Take some pictures. Mm-hmm. So we'll move on to uh, 5C, a flood forecast update by Dr. Bob Zimmerman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, council members, we've got a PowerPoint again, <clears throat> relatively brief tonight, uh, provide an update on the uh, forecast that came out uh, last week, which you've probably seen a little bit about in the media. I apologize for that. Uh, so uh, to begin, um, I thought it might be worthwhile to describe two different kinds of forecasts that you're going to see as this event unfolds. The first is the probabilistic forecast, which is what we're getting now from the National Weather Service. And as you'll note, that includes chances of the river stage going above a certain uh, elevation. <clears throat> uh, that is 
uh, based upon river model simulations that consider existing conditions and then take many years of historical weather data from this point forward, run that weather data through their uh, river models to project what might happen to generate those various probabilities of different river stages. So lowest uh, probability, smaller numbers are worst case. This is a pre-event forecast. There's, the water's not flowing yet. Uh, that's the difference between these two kinds of forecasts. And so these will and frequently do change over time as weather conditions change. So this is the way that the Weather Service uh, presents those various probabilities uh, in graphic form. Uh, on the left is the various river stage uh, river stages along the bottom are the various probabilities of exceeding that river stage. There's two lines you'll note. Uh, the blue line represents overall gen general historical conditions and the black line represents a conditional simulation based upon today's conditions. So the black line is the one that's pertinent and when the black line is significantly above the blue line that means that we are very likely to see some type of flood event. Now rather than try to pick off numbers there and give those to you, I, I, I put them in a table. So this is the forecast as of uh, last Thursday. Again, various chances uh, of different river stages from 95% to 5%. Uh, what the Weather Service was indicating uh, in a webinar that they uh, put on regarding this forecast is based upon current conditions, we should be considering those numbers in the 50 to 25% chance range. So that would be a river stage of about 35 to about 36 and a half, or 35 to 37. On the right are uh, historical flood crests. Uh, just to put that in perspective, and the one that almost everyone remembers, 2009, that was 40.8. Uh, you would note, though, that if we get something in that 50 to 25 percent range, it very well could put us in the top 10 uh, of flood events. So um, manageable at that level, but still a very significant flood event. The other kind of forecast that we will see later on is called the deterministic forecast. And this is a forecast that's made when water is now flowing in the system. So the Weather Service uses their model simulations again, uh, but they have various gauges throughout the basin that are providing information into that model to make projections. So that forecast shows up on what's called the hydrograph, which is what this graph is depicting. The blue line here represents the current conditions. When there's an active deterministic forecast, that blue line will have a red or burgundy extension to it. That represents forecast conditions on an hourly basis for roughly about a seven-day period. That forecast is critical for our flood plan imp implementation. We use that to determine daily what activities need to happen during the flood event. This is where we start to zero in on a number, a projected, a projected crest number. At this point, we're just talking probabilities. I wanted to make sure that we talked about this because one of the topics tonight is the uh, city's emergency measures policy, and that policy is referenced to this type of a forecast. So the next few slides are uh, borrowed directly from the Weather Service, uh, the National Weather Service's briefing from last week. We talked a little bit about uh, some of this uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the conditions that uh, create spring flooding and where we're at current, currently, so fall moisture is high, uh, existing stream flows are normal, but frost depth, snowpack, and snow water content are all on the high end, but none of those are extreme. And how this plays out will really depend upon temperature and precipitation that takes place over the next several weeks. I would note that the forecast numbers that we just talked about did include some estimation of the water content in the event from this past weekend, as well as some estimation for the event that we will likely experience later this week. <laughs> 
Uh, I agree 100%, by the way. <laughs> uh, so the later we get into the season, the, uh, the more likely it is that we end up with a rapid thaw, which is not good for, uh, for flood events. This is a, a depiction of the snow water content, which really represents the potential for flooding. Is there enough water out there to cause flooding? And the area in the circle there is uh, south of Fargo-Moorhead, and so you'll see the snow water content uh, as of last week was somewhere in the three to six inch range. Uh, this next graph shifts that a little bit. This is talking about excess in terms of departure from normal. On the left side is the spring of 1997, and on the right side is the spring of 2009. So these are amounts above normal snow water content. And you'll see numbers in those graphs from four to seven inches above normal. We're not at that point now, and so to put that in sort of a, a reference to past flood events, there isn't that volume of moisture, at least at this point. This is the current uh, moisture departure from normal, more in the uh, half inch to two and a half inch range, not the four, five, six, or seven inch range that it was during those previous events. Obviously, that doesn't tell us what's gonna happen over the next several weeks, but it does tell us a little bit about how much moisture is out there. Uh, at this point, uh, we thought it was uh, valuable to revisit a policy that was adopted by the City Council in 2013 regarding deploying emergency measures. So I took this language directly from the resolution that was adopted at that time. So when we talk about emergency measures, we're talking about uh, temporary clay levees and sandbags. So you'll note the first bullet, and there's three bullets that are important here, and I just highlighted some of the uh, more important text, that the city will deploy emergency measures to reduce the risk of flood damage to private property and public infrastructure off of the riverfront, and doing that may result in riverfront properties being located on the river side of those protection measures. The city will consider purchasing and delivering empty sandbags and loose sand to riverfront neighborhoods and or properties when there's a National Weather Service deterministic forecast that predicts a crest of 42 and a half feet or greater. Prior to that, we wouldn't consider any of those measures. And then the last one talks about coordinating deployment of, for example, sandbags and temporary clay levees, and that we would attempt to coordinate that to the extent we can. However, deployment of those emergency measures to protect property and public infrastructure off of the riverfront would take precedence over any private property measures. So that's the policy as it stands today. And I think it's important to consider that because how we plan for this event going forward is greatly, greatly impacted by that policy. So maybe we'll pause there for just a second. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zimmerman. Council Member Duran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. In your professional opinion, do you think 42.5 feet is too high that the city, per, should we look at implementing emergency measures bef if, if, if the deterministic forecast is lower than that? And if so, so at what level would you, in your professional opinion, would you recommend? Well, it, it really, protecting property off of the riverfront and protecting public infrastructure, we can do all of that. This is really about what we do for properties that remain on the riverfront. Okay. For example, if there's a property on the riverfront, let's just say that that property is at a river stage of 39 feet. If we had a flood exceeding that, we could and would put a clay levee on the backside of that property 
on the street side of that property. Public infrastructure is protected, other private property is protected. That property would have to fend for themselves. This was really following all of the, the acquisitions post 2009 that this policy was considered. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure <laughs> that my professional opinion drives the day here. Uh, it's more of a policy level decision for the city council. I would note providing sandbags is a very expensive mm -hmm. activity. Um, whether or not the city would be re reimbursed for that would depend upon if there's some sort of declaration. Right. And that's always been a risky thing in the past, 9, 10, and 11. The financial investment to provide those resources was very risky. It was. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I recall the conversations. Um, I'm just, I was just curious to know if you had a, a very strong stance on that number. In my professional opinion, ideally we would have levies continuous along the entire Correct. riverfront, right. which would mean acquiring additional properties, mm -hmm. which is part of our revised flood mitigation yeah, plan. Yeah, which is, yeah, and that's part of our plan, and that's what we yeah. want to do. Yep. Um, but to protect, so just to summarize, it's your belief that 42.5 is, that, that's, a, that's a safe number, that public infrastructure, private infrastructure will be safe. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if I can get the council or city manager Volkers and then Councilman Roy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Bob, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Was there some communication with the homeowners who remain mm -hmm. on the river set or riverfront about this policy recent within the last year? I recall discussions about that. I had a recollection of that too, and I remember talking about it. I don't know, don't recall if we actually did it. We're, okay. we're trying to find that. <laughs> at least draft letter that we had but it wouldn't have been the only communication to no, the property and, owners no right? and actually after tonight's discussion i think it would be behoove us to share that policy or any changes to that policy with all of the potentially affected property owners but prior to sending that letter out we wanted to make sure everybody was still on the same page okay. council member white it's one of the new council members. Uh, you know, it's hard to make a, you know, an educated decision about it without knowing more about the po possible impact. So I know at the last meeting, you gave us some information about it. You know, at certain levels, we know that uh, no private property is going to be affected. Can you give us some more information about that? If, just so we know, at, you know, at what point do we start to see some of the houses, some private property being affected? Um, you know, when does this become a more serious event? So I sort of anticipated that I would not be able to have this discussion with you without providing some, some of that information. Mm -hmm. So there is the very last slide of this presentation. And the reason I was hesitant, and I'll explain this when we put these numbers up, if we can go back to that. We'll get there. So various river stages, 38, 39, 40. So those are the river stages where properties would be impacted. Typically when we build protection measures, we try to achieve two feet of freeboard. Sometimes we don't get two feet, but for, for purposes of calculating numbers, we use two feet here. So what we're showing are the estimated numbers of properties that are impacted. So there's a total column and there's an Oakport neighborhood. And I, I pulled that Oakport neighborhood out specifically because this is the first flood event where that portion of the city, the Oakport neighborhood, is now part of the city. Every other flood event that we've been through or planned for did not include that. So I think it's important to just recognize that we're working on projects and acquisitions there but it may seem like we've taken a step backward in terms of some of these sandbag numbers uh, because there's a portion of that area that doesn't have a permanent project. So at various river stages, you'll see the total number citywide and the total number of sandbags. I would say these are very preliminary numbers, very conservative numbers. We are working on revising and refining these, but that was beyond the scope of what we could do from late last week to today. So I'm, these are on the high end 
of what you might expect. Uh, for reference, in 2009, our best estimate for a 40.8 foot flood, we used two and a half million sandbags. So I think that's probably what you were looking for is uh, And just um, for the record, Bob, in the, a lot of these um, homes that are would be on the river side of a temporary levy have been contacted about buyouts, and they chose not to. In some cases, not once, not twice, but more than that's correct. Two times. That is absolutely correct. The only exception being that area where we're working on a project in the Oakport neighborhood, the North right. Moorhead yeah. project. But beyond City that, proper prior to the Oakport um, yes. a annexation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know there are some that are in Oakport that were in the process last fall. Do yes. you know if they've been completed? or? For the uh, North Moorhead project, there's uh, roughly 25 or 26 properties that we needed. We have reached agreement to acquire or have already closed on about half of those, and we're in process with the remaining half. That project will reduce those numbers significantly, so that's why that is our number one priority for flood mitigation. Uh, you all approved an, an amendment to the agreement with the DNR for initial $2 million at our last meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Bob, um, <clears throat> later this week we're going to get walloped again with either rain or snow. Does that make a difference or is it just moisture? It, it, I mean, is it worse if it's rain? At this point, I don't know that it's necessarily worse because there's so much snow to melt before the systems really start flowing that I'm not sure that it really matters. It's moisture and eventually it's all going to find its way into the system. And um, and you can answer this, or you don't have to answer it. But um, how many events are we away from a 42 foot flood? How many? Because it's a wet spring, and we're just we're getting oh. it week after week after week. And I'm just, do you have an estimate on that? Or I, I'm I not really, say. I, I really don't. <laughs> okay, I have a feeling. I mean, if we get two more of these big snowstorms, we're going to be in trouble. So. And then not to alarm the public or anything, but that, yeah, it's just it seems there's a pattern and we're, we're in a wet cycle right now and it's, you know, it's it might get, you know, pretty pretty close to 40. So thanks, Bob. We'll, we'll, we'll learn a lot more in the next couple of weeks, I think. Council Member White. So two questions. One is, does, uh, I just want to make sure I'm reading this correctly. So before 38 feet, there are no private properties that no, are No, there are a few. Okay, so there are a few. It's less than it's less than twenty. Okay, and there are a, there are a couple that um, do not provide any protection, either on their own or even if we provided it. So there's there's a couple that a like a thirty two or thirty three foot river stage. Okay, that flood regularly. We've offered that buyout. Mm -hmm. No one's accepted. Most. It really starts at 38 where you see the number kind of jump up. There's just a mm -hmm. handful below that. Mm -hmm. And my other question is, I think it is reasonable to take into consideration if people have been offered a buyout and they have turned it down, but I'd want to know a little more about even the language of that. So if it, you know, it's, I'm guessing that it was made clear to them that in the event of a flood that we wouldn't be providing them with sandbag material or anything like that. And so they were, people were well of, aware of that. I think the Oakport part is a little different and I think it's worth giving some additional consideration to that because if we, you know, if that, if they're in the process and that wasn't something that they've turned down, um, that to, you know, to not do something to help those folks out at this point, you know, would, would seem, it seems more justifiable to do that. But I also wonder for the folks that, so it's one thing for us to say, well, if you didn't do the buyout, then sorry, you know, you knew what was happening. But is it realistic? F because by doing that, what impact does it have on the 
houses around them. So are we, you know, is that is that even a realistic thing to say? Is you know, we're we're not, you know, you you didn't sell your house, and we're not going to provide sandbags. But does that also then um, create problems for people around them? So okay. the, the uh, that's an excellent question. The 2009 was the first flood event where properties off of the riverfront were threatened. Mm -hmm. Normally, it's always been a riverfront issue, and that's why we went through all of these iterations. I can tell you that that policy was not adopted, not adopted on the council's first attempt at it. There were a couple of revisions and a, and a couple of attempts at different language to get to this, so there was a lot of thought put into it at that time. I, I do tend to agree that that Oakport situation is a little bit different. Uh, and so I think as we go forward planning, we, we can think about that a little bit differently. Most of the most of the properties there for the current forecast, properties off the riverfront are not going to be threatened. Mm -hmm. But that's it's an excellent point. I, I do want to go back though to the primary the primary function of the city here is protecting public infrastructure mm -hmm. and in this case the vast majority of properties which are not riverfront properties so we do have to balance that with the cost of providing emergency measures to those numbers that we saw up there and it sounds kind of cold to say that but that's just a matter of fact because that cost can be extreme I think the estimates we've used in the past is uh, production of sandbags anywhere from four to seven dollars per sandbag. Now, frequently that's done with volunteers, and so it's cheaper, but when you consider the full cost, that's the ballpark range. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Gertz. Um, I do want to point out that the policy would state that the people that have um, I, I decided not to accept the uh, numerous offers for buyout. They did so knowing that in the event of a major flood, the levy would be put on mm -hmm. the street side so we'd protect the rest of the city. So we aren't going to leave yeah, a uh, missing tooth yes. in our smile, uh, so to speak. Okay. Uh, the city would be protected. And then one other question for you. Uh, if we had the um, FM diversion, if that was functioning, how many of our residents would be in danger of at a flood elevation of four, or a crest of 40, 40 feet? So for that flood event? Yep. So that, the 100 year... Like the 2009 flood, which right. would be the record flood. So the 2009 flood, the uh, diversion project would have operated the in-town stage would not have gone above 37 feet. So we'd have very minimal Handful effort to um, handle a, a flood like that? Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions or comments for Dr. Zimmerman? Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. The last slide here is just a repeat of what we talked about before. This is These are all the various things that we'll be doing. The direction that I think I got here was that the policy should be shared with uh, riverfront property owners, and if we consider any deviation, it would be for those in the Oakport area that have not had a previous buyout offer. Really appreciate that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, item, <clears throat> I'm going to offer my apologies off the bat i'm uh still in learning mode but what i would have said after the uh, pledge of allegiance is that uh, for individuals that wish to address the uh, council during the meeting uh, there are yellow forms right outside in the lobby way that you need to fill out and i'll also bring to our clerk uh, <clears throat> in order to address the uh, council and the council uh, as far as citizens addressing the account, so uh, this is an opportunity uh, for members of the public to address us uh, on items that are not on the current agenda. Items requiring council action may be deferred to staff or boards or, and commissions for research and future 
and future council agendas if appropriate. As stated, there are all these forms in the back by the elevators. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone tonight is here to address uh, the uh, council, but if you were to address the council, uh, there's a three minute uh, limit uh, unless there's further time granted uh, by, well, I guess yours truly. But, uh, <clears throat> but uh, for right now, I do see that there is one request that is filled out, but I'm looking at the agenda item, so I'm assuming uh, Mr. McCall wants to speak during the public meeting. Is that accurate? Okay, so we'll. At, at the agenda item, which is coming up. Yep. And, and that's perfectly fine. I just wanted to, to clarify uh, based on the title that that's when you wanted it to be heard. Okay. Right. We'll move on to uh, public hearing. And we have three uh, set for this evening. And then number nine, this is the public hearing for the Brentwood, Rolling Estates, and McCann's Edition Street Improvements. And can I get a motion to open the public hearing? Motion made by Council Member Duran, seconded by Council Member Carlson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <coughs> Mr. Trowbridge. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council. So we'll have three public hearings tonight and for because three different projects effectively. And what I've got is the first of these includes some additional slides that won't be in the other two because it's really repetitive and I don't want to make it go longer than I need to. So, all right. So the all of these projects come from our capital improvement program, and so I'll start this. Brentwood, Roland Acres, and McCanns is a grouping of streets from our city CIP, and the public hearing tonight. What we're doing is we're meeting the requirements of Minnesota statutes. Uh, since we're proposing to use special assessments to finance at least part of the project cost, we have to hold a public hearing. Okay, We can hold it at any time. Sometimes we, we could have held this back in November when we started the process, or as it is for what we're doing tonight is we're holding it prior to awarding the bids is what we'd like to do. So the nice thing about holding the hearing later like this as we have more detailed information available. That's especially important for this first one because we found out that our assessment rates are actually higher than they need to be, which is kind of a welcome thing here. So, and I'll get to that later. And then with the public hearing, for all of these projects we're looking at tonight, not a single one of them was brought to us by the people living on those streets saying, please do this project. They all came from our CIP, which is intended to extend the life of the streets to the greatest extent possible. So we focus a lot on streets that might not look that bad, but they're roads that we're able to mill and overlay to get another 25 to 30 years of life out of them. There are roads in the city that have a lot of potholes and are really in trouble. We'll get to those when we're doing projects in those areas, but those streets, it's not as cost effective for us to tackle those. We could spend all of our capital improvement budget and do a third or less of the streets that we're getting done every year. So our, our best value is to keep the roads in good condition and bring those ones that have really fallen down, we'll bring those up when we get to them, but in the meantime, they still have some life left and we're trying to get what we can out of those. But since we didn't have petitions for these projects, that means we've got a higher threshold. We're going to need at least seven votes of the council in favor of these projects in order to order them, okay? And since there's seven of you here tonight, that means we need a unanimous vote for these projects. Okay. If the projects had been petitioned for, then a simple majority could order the improvements, and then awarding the bid falls to the six votes that we need, uh, which is by city charter. So that's, a, that's not through the statutes, but by city charter. 
Okay, so the petitions, they streamline the process. It's great when we have petitions, but we almost never get petitions for anything other than a brand new housing development, and that's when you have one property owner who wants to use the city financing of special assessments in order to uh, expedite their project. For a, a project like this, we, I can't think of a time where we actually had petitions to do any of these projects. Okay. So another part of the special assessment process through Chapter 429 of Minnesota Statutes, we have to prepare an engineering report. For these projects, that report was prepared and received by the council previously. The hearing tonight, we kind of summarize it again because the whole point of those reports is to evaluate the projects and determine whether or not they are necessary, cost effective, and feasible, whether they should be done on their own or combined with some other improvements. And, uh, and we're also supposed to discuss the financing and specifically the methodology of the special assessments. Okay. And then the council also approves the plans, which was done previously, authorized us to go to bids. And then after we do all of this, so if you order these projects and we construct them, then we'll have one more hearing in the fall. That's the assessment hearing. And for these projects, the actual at the assessment hearing, the numbers that we talk about today and the numbers that get assessed then really shouldn't change. Okay, and that's because our policy does not assess 100% of these costs. So the construction cost won't matter. We have flat assessment rates for most of these things. Okay. okay. So our CIP, uh, and some of these next slides came from a presentation back actually in January of 2016, and that's, that's when we really focused on the amount of money the city should be trying to do every year in order to maintain our streets in a, in a good condition. And that targeted having us spending six to eight million dollars a year. Some of that is from some general funds that we have, but otherwise most of it we have to bond for. And when we have to bond for it, we have to special assess part of that cost. Okay. And so we consider all of this in preparing our our five-year capital improvement plan. Okay, that slide isn't showing all the numbers on the screen. I'm not sure why. So, but this was a slide out of that report again. And what that really is showing is the lighter blue number that's in the upper left corner is the city share of project costs that doesn't even get assessed. So we'll bond in that lighter blue and the orange. So more than 50% of all of the money we spend, we're going to bond for in any given year. About one third of what we bond for gets special assessed and the other two thirds, the city has to pay. And the city makes up that money through the general tax levy. Okay. And the reason we're using special assessments and bonding instead of doing it all through the general tax levy, again, the, the bonding gives us, there's more flexibility to it in, in, in how we do that. So, okay. so again, this is all from uh, the uh, prior CIP preparation that we've done, and the council updates that CIP every year, typically November, December, sometimes in January. In this case, it was last updated in December of 2018. But uh, we, we update that five-year CIP, and again, our focus is on preservation of the existing streets. We look at what's called the PCI, is Pavement Condition Index. Uh, we have a contractor, actually, every year that uh, surveys about one-third of the city streets. So every three years, we've surveyed all of the streets. And they, they've got a vehicle that drives it. And it measures cracks and ruts and bumps and, and a lot of those other things. And we get a running track record. So since we come back to each street every three years, we can see how that number changes over time and how rapidly it may be deteriorating. And that helps us decide which streets to include in our five-year CIP and when we time them. And so again, we're trying to do mostly mill and overlay. 
We have another uh, step that we call it uh, rehabilitation, which means we're fully removing and replacing the pavement, but we're keeping the curb and gutter. That's generally going to be at least twice the cost of a mill and overlay, but it's usually less than half the cost of a reconstruction. When we have to remove and replace all of the curb and gutter, we start getting into everybody's driveways, we have a lot of turf to restore, people aren't usually happy with seeding, so sometimes you get more sodding with that, you get into sprinkler systems, it just really gets exponential. So we try to get by with the mill and overlay and the rehabs. And we coordinate the plan with the Public Works Department, with Morehead Public Service, and Finance Department. And what we're doing is trying to maintain the status quo in the short term, and eventually we'll, we'll ha hopefully see a slight increase. The current pavement condition index citywide has been in the low 70s, and if we can maintain the 6 to $8 million a year spending, we think we can get up close to 80 and have that be a, a sustainable number. Okay. And this map is available on the city uh, website. And, we, and again, this is what we update every year. Uh, and it shows all of the projects that we have currently programmed for the next five years. Out of those projects, what we show in 2019, obviously we're proceeding on those. Every year you move down, it gets a little more theoretical, so it's not unusual for streets to shift up or down on that, depending on how the financing has worked and, and where we're at. You know, sometimes, for example, the underpass project will drive where we, we're using more state aid dollars on that, and as a result, 30th Avenue South is a good example. That was a project that we had considered doing this year from 14th to 20th Street, but we pushed that back because we needed state aid dollars, which is the gas tax money we get. Uh, and we, we just were, weren't going to have that money available to do this year, so we pushed that back. And so on the left of this slide, you can see highlighted the various projects that we'll be doing this year. We'll have another set of public hearings at the next council meeting to consider several of those other projects that are on there. So now, focusing specifically on the Brentwood, Roland, and McCann's area. In the CIP, we had these as two different project numbers, but through the report and analyzing it as close as these are together, as similar as they are for work, it made sense for us to bundle them, make them one project. These are former Oakport Township roads. We don't have really good records on them, but Based on platting and what we can see from aerial photos, we know they were paved some, sometime between the 1970s and uh, about 2000. Okay. And, I, and I believe the Brentwood and Roland Acres area was older because it was before 1990 because the sewer and water project was done in 1990 and the roads were paved at that time. McCann's, I know, was paved in around 2000, based on the aerial photos. Okay. In any case, the roads, the PCI they have, falls into the range of what we would consider appropriate for a mill and overlay. And that also matches up with what we know of the age of the roads and the type of construction that there's enough pavement there that we can mill and overlay it. There are no sidewalks in this area and the utilities are in good condition. Drainage is not the ideal urban drainage, but for a rural drainage system, it's, it's not unusual. We are still working with some of the property owners. If they're interested, we'll look and try to evalu evaluate if there are some improvements that can be made. At our first look at it, we pretty much have to reconstruct the whole thing to make it work properly or the best way. But there may be some localized areas that if somebody says, you know, that there's six inches of water there and it really bothers me, and we might be able to figure out an easy solution for that one area. And if they want to uh, petition, we could work with them on doing a project to fix small areas like that. So there are no utility improvements included in this plan set at this time. And so what was proposed was a mill and overlay, no sidewalks, 
consistent with the current policy. This area doesn't have any sidewalks and the right of way just doesn't allow for it because it's a rural uh, sit situation. If we totally reconstructed the streets, put in curb and gutter and a storm sewer system, we could find a way to fit sidewalks in. But with the ditches that we have to maintain, we can't put sidewalks in and stay within the right of way. So this year we did have a, a util or a, an early design informational meeting where we talked to residents and this particular project I think drew more interest than many of the others so we we bundled all of our projects in in that same meeting and we had about 60 people show up and I would guess at least half of them were from these projects and there was a lot of good discussion on it one of the questions people actually asked we talked about we just this year adopted a new policy of having $15 a foot or, or $20 a foot for the mill and overlay rate and I, there was at least one of them that said oh it should probably be lower and it turned out they were right we should be a little bit lower and I'll get to that but we were kind of guessing based on our estimates but it shows how much the sidewalk and curb and gutter impact is on those as long as you don't have to do other things uh, the just the mill and overlay is actually a pretty affordable project so we had a public hearing notice that went out on February 28th it was mailed to all of the property owners um, most people should have gotten that fine I know there have been some recent property owner changes and and so every it's not unusual to have a few letters that come back we also publish it in the FM extra and then we had in that notice that got mailed out we informed people that there was an informational meeting to be held last week and I would say there were 10 or 15 people that showed up at that again the larger share of people were for the Oakport project that came to that and most of the questions tend to come around how do you determine the assessments and why did you pick this street project uh, so so this year we adopted a the a twenty dollar per adjusted front foot rate for a rural mill and overlay and as it turns out that would generate more than 100 percent of the project cost based on the bids we did get very good bids a couple of weeks back and so what we're suggesting is going with a different rate it doesn't have to be selected now we'll bring that rate to the council for approval sometime this summer since the notice that was mailed out was twenty dollars per foot if we lower what we put in the notice theoretically everything is okay because people would have had their chance to comment or complain about it so going down is good going up is bad and in this case we just thought well what if we did it at 15 and you can see that that would generate around you know 70 75 percent or so of the project cost this area is fully developed there's no postponed or deferred special assessments the everybody gets the same rate and then the front footage is adjusted if someone's a corner lot we have adjustments that reduce their footage things like that if they're on a curve there's adjustments all of it is trying to uh, spread the specials as equitably as we can so that property owners have a similar assessment okay so for this project there are 130 properties if we go with the $15 per foot assessment rate the average assessment would be about two thousand three hundred and fifty dollars uh, the smallest is 255 that uh, must be a remnant lot uh, and then the median assessment is two thousand one hundred dollars and the maximum was three thousand nine hundred dollars and then the city owns at least one property up there that was in the assessment area so and so if we use that fifteen dollar rate that's what this slide shows uh, we would be assessing about seventy nine percent of the project cost and the city would be absorbing twenty one percent of the project cost and what this would also mean is the city share would have to get financed through local property taxes spreading that out uh, over 20 years the annual debt levy impact would be five thousand one hundred and seventy dollars per year uh, for the city to pay that share of the debt levy back 
which with the current property tax base in Moorhead would mean a 26 cent increase on the median value home of $180,000. And then this just summarizes the schedule. If we uh, order the improvements after the close of tonight's meeting and award the bids, the project would get, struck, get constructed sometime this summer, most likely June, July, August, but it could be anywhere from May through September. And then we would call for the assessment hearing and hold the assessment hearing this fall. So again, the, what, what we're asking the council to consider tonight is after holding the hearing and receiving any other public comment to decide whether or not to order the improvements and to award the bids. And then you give us some direction, I guess, if we're on the right track is $15 the appropriate amount or would you want us to do something more or less than that for an assessment rate just doesn't even have to be a resolution as far as that goes just something if you think that's about right and then we'll bring something to the council at a later date so thank you thank you mr. Trowbridge uh, council member white may have some questions or comments Tom, thank you very much, and I, and I have to say this has been really informative, and I think I'm going to start talking about mill and overlay in my sleep now. <laughs> and so um, a lot of this, I just, I, the questions I'll have tonight are just in part just to educate myself about this. So one of the things I noticed on this one, um, it, you mentioned the total project cost was 385, estimated at 385,200. And then on the material that went out to neighbors, it says, Seven hundred fifty thousand, and is that is the three eighty five two hundred? Is that just the part to be assessed that we're looking to assess? And because the seven hundred fifty thousand is through the PRI PIR fund and through assessment. So I just I yeah. wanted to. No, okay. that's that's a good question. Okay. The if you actually look back to the December CIP when we first did it. Uh, we we had plugged in a number of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It was really a ballpark cost, and we we would rather be high when we're that far in advance. So we estimated conservatively. Still, in retrospect, we estimated more conservatively. This was really okay. our first rural type project, so we we estimated a little bit too conservatively, and that's kind of where we're at. But. That seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars is part of the reason we didn't want to go less than twenty at the time we were setting the rate, is we still okay. weren't sure what this type of a project was going to cost okay. us. Okay. So that's really helpful. So yeah, that's that's where that seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar number came from, was the earlier version of the engineering report. Okay. So. Council Member Dahlquist. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I. I had someone ask me about the weight of the equipment on those roads where there's the cul-de-sacs. Is that going to affect, is that going to be a problem? The roads, we, we have done soil borings and the roads have good gravel base under them and they've got enough bituminous on them that even in the springtime they would be at least a seven ton road, might even be, it'd be borderline nine ton road. And so, and that means the the weight on each axle being nine tons. So, since the construction will be happening in the summer, which is outside the the what you know, when when we talk about a road being a seven ton or a nine ton road, that actually is really looking at in the spring conditions. So, we would not be concerned about the construction traffic doing a mill and overlay. This is the type of road that we do mill and overlays on all the time. So we're confident about that. Absolutely. Um, also, you're talking about the drainage, the ditches, and perhaps in the future doing something because they're not draining correctly, as I understand it. And so would it be better to wait and do all of this at once when you can look at that problem? So part of what we look at with the drainage is we know there'd be a significant cost to try to do large-scale drainage improvements. Effectively, we'd completely redo the entire right-of-way because the culverts are they're haphazardly installed, I guess is probably the best way to phrase it. 
one is one is at this elevation, the next one's there, then it's up here, and that leads to so while the ditches generally flow, the culverts are at different elevations, and so you trap a little bit of water, and, and some of the areas are worse than others. For us to proceed with a drainage improvement, it should really, I mean, that, that's outside of the scope of what we normally do with this. Uh, this is a pavement management program. Usually the, our best bet is going to be to go down a lot line to find, like for example, McCann's addition, there's a drainage ditch on the north end, on the north side of that development that's deeper, which we could pretty easily get water to drain to, so the properties that are on the north side, we could probably make drainage go that way. Properties that are further in, it, it gets to be a lot more challenging to do that. If, if we got feedback from people that they really wanted us to do that, there's still time for us to try to get as a change order into a culvert across a road if we needed to but in our experience dealing with these usually it's it's highly unlikely that people are going to want to see I want to see us proceed because the cost is is pretty high when we start doing that but we'll we'll still meet with them and find out what we expect to be able to do is in some areas we may be able to make a drainage improvement that goes from the ditch away from the road towards, but they'd need to give us an easement to do it as well, but I'm thinking things like that. The north side of McCann's, we could get to that ditch. Brentwood, because of the levee project, there's actually plenty of storm sewer in the backyards. So again, if we can get from the ditch that's at the road down a side lot line to the backyard, if there's some areas that people have deep concern over, that's going to be our most cost-effective way to get there rather than trying to rebuild the entire ditch system and, and redo everybody's driveway and culvert. So that's that's what we expect it to be. And if people have, if people see a significant drainage problem, they may want to proceed. But if it's just a few inches of water and it goes away after a few days, I, I would be very surprised that anybody is going to want to proceed on it. So that's why we're, we're going to continue working with them. and. We don't think it's going to affect the road project because the most likely options are for us to go from the ditch away from the road. So. Council Member White. I wanted to just bring up the issue of the $15 or $20. Um, and some of this, it, it, this is going to come up later on the agenda and item 11 when we talk about the Belsley East area because that one is for the city it's for city roads it's assessed at $30 a foot right mm -hmm. and in that one the costs are less but that less than what had been anticipated but we're not proposing lowering it and so I think we should just just to talk about that a little bit more of why we might lower it in one case and not in the other and my understanding is in part because if we assess at twenty dollars we'll actually bring in more than the cost of the project right and then and we're prohibited from doing that right and in the Belsley case we would it's less than what we aren't anticipating but um but it doesn't get up to that threshold is that so that's the first question is that correct am i understanding that correctly correct okay. all all of the other projects that we're considering tonight the amount that we're assessing is is definitely less than what we bid. This is the one project where the bid amount is higher than what we're proposing to assess. Okay. Would it make sense then, rather than just, yeah. just um, and as you said, we don't have to make a decision right now, but if we do the 15, then we end up actually taking on greater debt. And so it would seem as a matter of equity of just, if we're lowering it, to do it in a way that um, would not add to you know, add to the city, the add to the debt for other folks, but to just take that, you know, bring it down to a level that would cover the cost. Because if we do 15, then we end up actually not getting enough to cover it and have to yeah. then take on that additional cost, right? Correct. If we assess 100% of the cost, then there's no impact to the debt levy. Um, where for these projects, we like having a flat rate rather than every time you do a project having to set another rate for it. That's one reason why we would prefer to be at least slightly under. Right. 
and, and that would mean we'd have a city share because say next year we get really good bids and for some reason the way the project lays out there's always some variability with the assessments maybe we adopt a rate that this year was eighteen dollars and twenty cents because that got us a hundred percent maybe next year on another project eighteen dollars and twenty cents is still a little too high and so it's mm -hmm. it's it's a balancing act on that and that's kind of where we just figured a nice round number is a little easier to do and something that makes sure that we're a little under so we don't uh, run into this the on a future project so well, to follow up but we're not really for this one we're not changing the rural rate right we're going to keep it at 20 is what are well, you I, unless I, you're proposing that we change the policy or I took it as just for this particular project we can't really assess them at twenty dollars a foot because that would bring in more than that we're prohibited from going over that one hundred percent. Right. What we were proposing, we just assumed we would want to adopt a new rural rate that would apply to all projects oh, okay. going forward. That was what we were assuming. Mm. We could do, I mean, again, it doesn't have to be done that way. You could do it as a project specific. I'm fairly confident based on this, if we left it at $20 a foot and we did another mill and overlay, we'd probably be looking at the same issue again where we'd be a little bit too high. Okay. But since this is, all, this is just our first time that we've, w using that rate for rural projects, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So it would if we were to wait to until we saw some others we we could in effect for this one and and really the policy would be for any of them so even the thirty dollar rate that if we happen to get a bid for a project in the city for a city street that ended up bring, the assessment at thirty dollars would bring in more than we couldn't in those cases assess those people for thirty dollars correct Correct. Okay. So wouldn't it make sense to, if we kept it at $20 right now for the, the rural rate, but then um, with the condition that, um, the, that um, I don't know how I would just say this, but that not to exceed, you know, that it's, the rate is $20 unless um, the, that would exceed the, the overall cost of the project, in which case then we adjust it accordingly to make sure that we just get them into um, paying no more than 100% of the project. I, I believe, I guess I'll defer to the city attorney sense. on that. I believe as long as we're not assessing more than 100% yeah. that we could do it that way. Uh, from, from the staff side of it, we just like the, the simplicity of having a rate that we apply evenly to everybody and not have to factor that in, but it's, mm -hmm. it can be done either way, I think. so. Any uh, questions or comments? Councilmember Dahlquist. Thank you, Mayor. Then could we hold off on this until we have a better determined rate? Can we do that? Well, <laughs> I, I guess we're, what I would like to be able to do is award the bid so the contractor can program it into their schedule and, and proceed. I think, you know, again, the rate can certainly be adopted later. We've got up until the assessment hearing to make that decision. And I think, you know, it would be fine actually at the time we do that, we can be very generic. We can just simply say, okay, this is the, how we did this project. Do you want to change the flat rate or do you just want to be project specific and have the discussion about that? That's, I think that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. I think it shouldn't matter whether or not we order the improvement. I think the amount we're talking about as being an effect on the city uh, uh, tax base is still pretty small relative to a lot of other projects. So again, we would propose just proceeding and ordering the improvements and awarding the bid and we can discuss what the most appropriate rate is. I guess we would need to know the rate before we issue the bond because that will set the terms of the bond. Usually we've been doing that bond in June, July, that time frame. So there's still time to work that out. Councilmember White. 
When you say there's still time to work it out, are you talking about those for what for what we would determine for this project? Because I see it as Correct. two separate issues, Correct. right? And I and that's why I think you know again of, of figuring out how much these folks will be assessed for this project is one thing, but in terms of changing that rate that we we set the policy of twenty dollars a foot for rural roads, that that's the part. And I don't know if if council member. Um, Delquist was referring to that too that that perhaps to wait on that just to see if I hope that you're right that it would be great if we find that um, that that's too high of a rate and we can bring it down but I would rather be cautious and not have it be where when we the next bids come in and now they're much higher and we're only a set we have a policy at $15 okay. and one other point I would make I guess is this is the only project this year that will have that rural rate. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the next, boy, it, it's hard it, to tell by the color, but it'll be a few, I think it'll be a few years, sorry. That's uh, Mr. Trowbridge, I think uh, Mr. Shockley wanted to comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Perhaps maybe I can add a little bit of clarification. So tonight what the council has in front of it is determining whether or not you want to order the improvements. The discussion about the rate of special assessments is advisory only tonight. You, later on during the assessment process, you set the assessments. So while that's valuable information, uh, your decision tonight is do you want to proceed with the project? Um, and you can certainly come back later mm -hmm. after you've ordered the improvements, discuss what the amount of assessment should be. Uh, and frankly, you won't, you won't have all the information about what the assessment will be because you could potentially run into change orders. Uh, there could be deducts there. So that's why the process is two parts. You order the improvement and then later on you have a discussion about what the special assessments uh, to be levied are. I think what engineering has always tried to do is offer kind of a, an estimate of what the cost will be so that the homeowners understand what the likelihood of their assessments will be. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Shockley. Uh, Mr. Trowbridge, the only question I have is uh, when this project is done, uh, what's kind of the uh, <clears throat> timeline? I mean, how long will it last before? Oh. We, we gave the contractor a pretty large window to do the work, figuring it would be kind of fill in. They could, they could set it. If, they, if it turns out that they wanted to come in and take the whole project down because they got nothing else going on, they'll do that. Otherwise, they may take pieces of it because it's, it's still a large enough project. They may prefer to mobilize in two or three different times. I would expect when they get into a neighborhood and start working, they, I mean, it's a mill and overlay. It'll go fast. Uh, they'll have some manhole adjustments and then and then they'll pave it. No, I'm sorry. I, I probably should clarify. Once this project is done, like how long will like the durability, like how, how oh, long oh, in, that, in the future? Yeah. So they won't come back in like five yeah. some years. So as far as a mill and overlay, we would expect to get 20 to 25 years before we would have to do another significant project. We would also expect public works to come in and seal coat either next year or the year after. That, that's a good preservation tool on top of that. The, but the seal coating is something the city does out of its own budget, and that's not an assessed cost. So the mill and overlay would be assessed. Then we'd do a seal coat and expect to get another 20, 25 years out of it. Well, thank you. I just want to make sure that if we're looking to assess that there's value. So yes. this is a 25, 30 year Yes. Last thing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, just to clarify, in short term, um, we're going to order the improvements and uh, award the bid mm -hmm. tonight. That's it. Correct. That's all I need. Thanks. Okay. Council Member Watson Curry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Tom, quick question. Um, uh, in the packet, it talked about sort of piecing together the history of when these roads last had improvements. Do we have better records for the remainder of the roads in our Oakport area, or what's kind of your assessment or the lay of the land in that capacity? Uh, for North Crystal Creek, which is just south of McCann's, I know that was paved in about 2002. Um, otherwise, I really, all we can do is like uh, the country heritage, that's an area that, again, I know the pavement was, existed before 1990, and I believe the plat was early 60s or might have been, you know, that's, 
that's that's the extent of the knowledge I have in the other streets. Um, and we can do soil borings, and it, that'll at least tell us how the road is constructed. Um, you know how much gravel and asphalt it has, but other than that, that's about the best we can do on the timeline. So. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> unless there's any other further comment, I would call the question, or is there a motion? Uh, mm -hmm. I move that we close the public hearing. Before... We haven't talked wait. about 10 and 11 yet. No, hold on. There's still nine. No, we can't close it yet. I think of uh, the procedure, we would have to... I have to ask twice. Um, is there... Unless there's any other We haven't comments. talked about... 10 or 11 yet? No, because we have to go in 9, close 9, oh. go into 10. Okay. But yes. before we get to that point, I'm sorry for the confusion. So at this point, if, unless council doesn't have any questions or comments, it is now uh, the public, if there's anyone here for the, pu for the public hearing uh, that wishes uh, to speak uh, on this matter, uh, please feel free to do so. Mr. Mayor, ex Point of clarification, is that item number nine only? Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Only on, only on item number nine. So I'll ask again, is there anyone here in, in the audience that would like to speak on the, the public hearing regarding item number nine? Seeing none, then I will defer to Councilmember Gertz and his prior motion to close the public hearing. So he said motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember White. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. We are now exiting public hearing. And now, is there a motion to approve the resolution? Approve Council Member Duran, motions to move to approve. Second by Council Member Carlson. All in favor? A and B. Oh, sorry. That's item 9, A and B. <clears throat> there has been a second. All in, all in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. So now we move into public hearing for item number 10, which is a public hearing for 43rd Avenue North Street Improvements. And so now I'll have to make, or ask for a motion to open a public hearing on item number 10. A. Motion made by Councilmember Hendrickson, second by uh, Councilmember Watson Curry. All in favor of say motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. We are now in public hearing for item number 10. Okay. All right, so this is the public hearing for the paving of 43rd Avenue North. And this is a former township road. It's a section line road that runs between Oakport Street North and Highway 75. It's about a quarter mile long. It's about 36 feet wide and it's a gravel road. Uh, in this case, the only knowledge we really have other than that it's been a township road for many years is at the low point, there used to be a low point in the road that would flood at about 37 and a half feet. And that's where you can see a culvert in the picture there, kind of near the middle. And we actually were able to get some flood mitigation dollars to elevate the road. So now the road is a cons consistent 44-foot river stage elevation all the way across. So we added a lot of gravel, uh, improved the, made the culverts larger. And, and, and so now we know it's got a very good solid gravel base. And as a result, it becomes a very good candidate for what we refer to as a shape and pave, which basically means minimal blading of it and then putting asphalt down on top. And this is another one. The, the, the sewer main was installed in 1990. It's in good condition. There's no water main along here. And this is another rural drainage system. There's no curb and gutter. There's uh, no storm sewer. What we're proposing to do is shape and pave, have a 32-foot wide bituminous surface, and we had actually looked at having the city public works guys do the paving. And we expected that we'd be able to save a fair amount of money doing that. It turns out we were wrong about that. Uh, 
And it really comes down to it's because the all of the people that make asphalt are actually contractors that they make their money placing it as well. They have to keep their crews busy. And if they're making asphalt for us, it means they've got a crew sitting there waiting for asphalt to be delivered. And result is they charge a lot more for the material when they give it to us than it just costs them to produce. And that's because it slows them down. So the end result is for only about $10,000 more, it goes from 160000 if we do all of the work ourselves but just buy the asphalt versus $170,000 to hire a contractor to do it. That would take our public works guys probably a good solid week to get that done. And we figure they've got better things to do for that $10,000 uh, to provide other services to the city. That And so based on all of that, we're really recommending that we go with the contracted out option and, and that's what we're planning on doing. And so we did not actually, since this one doesn't have residents living directly on it, we didn't actually include this when we did the notice for the informational meeting back in January. Although it actually was discussed, somebody asked were we paving it and we said yes we were planning on paving that and generally people were happy that we were proposing to pave it. And we did say that there would be special assessments, but at the time, back in January, we really didn't know what that was going to be. And then we had the mailed public hearing notice that went out on February 28th. And then we had a public informational meeting. And typical for a collector street, this has an assessment area that extends out a ways. And that is really what always gets the most attention on these projects. People either think the assessment area should be larger because they want to see other people also pay for it, or they think it should be smaller because they don't think they should be in that assessment area. What we usually do is we go approximately halfway to the next collector or arterial street. Our first run through on this actually had a larger assessment area. We considered assessing it all the way up to Wall Street on the north and all the way down to 28th Avenue on the south. Even though Wall Street and 28th Avenue are collectors, they're also county state aid highways. We don't usually have much of a cost share when they do projects, especially if it's a rural type roadway. So, but we thought we should shorten up if we do, if the county does a project, maybe there'd be a reason to do a bike path or some other improvements that the county wouldn't normally consider and having that as an area wide would benefit us. So for new construction, and that's what this would be, because it's brand new pavement, it's an improvement, we would assess 100% of the project cost. And as it turns out, if you actually look in the pavement management of existing roads for a collector arterial, the area wide is typically $500 per equivalent lot. The shape and pave is, is not that expensive. So as it turns out, whether we did the collector as a rehab or overlay, it would be the same rate as what we're doing. We proposed a $500 per equivalent lot rate. And that would generate $170,000 in assessments. So we would be able to finance this project for that. Okay, and in this case, there is some undeveloped property that's adjacent to 43rd Avenue North that's in this assessment area. And per our policy, we'll have postponed or deferred specials for that. About one-third of the cost that we're proposing to assess would be postponed or deferred, which means the city would pay that cost until such time as that land develops. It could be a long time before that happens. So we, we do have to be prepared for that. All total, there were 222 notices that got sent out. We had that $170,000 amount was the basis for determining that specials. The average assessment was $766. The minimum was $500. The maximum was $37,990. That's one of the actual deferred specials. So that ends up being for the short term paid by the city. And the city share will go up on this because we have been buying some properties that are in this mm -hmm. area. Every house we buy would be another $500 that would become a city share. And I think we're at around a dozen or so that we're likely to have purchased and there's probably going to be a few more. Okay. So again, uh, this is summarizing what our, uh, oh, I see I've 
I've got a typo in this. this I copied this from the previous project. The total cost is $170,000, not the 385 that shows there. Uh, the special assessments would be 100% of what the total cost is. And since the city has a cost share, the city, sh in order to pay the city share, the annual debt levy would have to go up $3,800, which would be equivalent to a 19 cent tax increase on the current median value home. And so the schedule on this, we did the report previously and the plans and specs authorizing solicitation of quotes has already been approved. So we do not have quotes for the contractor paving yet, although we're pretty sure what it'll be because the contractor that had the low quote for selling us materials is also the contractor who got the other Oakport project and they've told us that they would honor the bid price in that which would be which would allow us to build this project for the hundred and seventy thousand dollars so and their bid price to place the asphalt and do it all was sixty dollars a ton and just to sell us the asphalt I think it was fifty six dollars a ton so that just shows you why it, it's really not worth it for us to do it ourselves uh, for this project. So what we would like to do is get quotes and we'd bring those to you back in uh, probably in April and then this would be another project that would get constructed sometime in that May through September time frame and then we'd hold an assessment hearing this fall. So what we would like you to do tonight is to hold the public hearing uh, after closing the hearing to consider a resolution to order the improvements. Thank you, Mr. Trubich. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Tom, real quick question. Uh, looking at the, the pictures, the satellite pictures, um, are those the organic gardens? Uh, so north, yeah, so the north side is Probes Field. Yep. That's the other, I think their assessment was around $20,000 for and the assessment area also included the probes field stuff on the west side of Oakport okay. Street. So, are yes. we keeping that in mind be when we schedule the project? Because that road mm -hmm. is extremely utilized from May to September, um, and there isn't any other access into those gardens mm -hmm. except that point right on the corner of 43rd and Oakport. So you're going to have a whole lot of upset farmers, gardeners, if they can't get into their gardens. Access, this is the nice thing with the shape and pave. It's kind of like a mill and overlay. They're going to show up to, to pave, and a contractor could knock this out in a couple of days. So mm -hmm. they won't be out of access for any extended time, and if it turns out that people are needing to get in as close as their driveway is to Oakport Street, we can probably accommodate it even while we're out there doing the okay. project. So, right. uh, yeah, we have not had discussions with them on that, but we're very confident we can accommodate their needs. All right, thank you. Councilmember White. Tom, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that extra $10,000. So I know, so if we outsource it, it'll be $10,000 more. Uh, and I, and I know it doesn't seem a lot, but I think for the folks paying for it, they may, you know, they may feel a little less comfortable, but I, when it looks like it's about $45 a property, right? Cause there's 222 properties. And if you could just talk a little bit more about it, cause even that additional $10,000, but you, it doesn't take into account the um, city labor. So it's really not, you know, it's, Correct. So if you could give us a stronger justification, like what are, what are some of the other uh, other costs that we will incur if we don't outsource it that really bring those numbers in closer to each other? Well, I did not ask Steve Moore to give me what his labor cost would be for tying up a crew for a solid week. I don't know if you'd know that off, but I'm guessing it's more than $10,000. So. Point of clarification. Yes, um, you know, Tom and, and Councilmember White, Mr. Mayor, it is more, well more than $10,000. Yes. In addition to the fact that the crews are designated, we've already approved their projects to take a whole week. This was not, mm -hmm. this is not part of it. Mm -hmm. So that 10000 is actually, it's way more cost effective and cost um, responsible to do it by adding it onto the project. 
versus city crews in this situation. So, yeah. Tom, your yeah. judgment was right, in my opinion. Yeah. And that's I just think people, I want people to know that. So if they see yeah. us just saying, oh, 10,000 isn't that much. But if really yeah. it's not actually, if you look at the additional costs that we would incur as a result of it, that it's justifiable. Yeah. That's what I wanted you to know. Yeah. There is a member of the public to speak. Correct. Yes, I wanted to make sure that there was no, <clears throat> there were no f further questions or comments uh, from council before we move into that area. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Trowbridge. Is there anyone here in the audience that would like to speak on the public hearing? I do have um, a form from uh, Mr. McCall. You want to approach the podium and uh, please state your uh, name and your address. Hi, my name is Scott McCall. Uh, I live at 1905 56th Avenue North, um, which is quite a ways away from this project, but it's in the northern assessment of it, which I would argue that you guys not do this for the fact that if you just go a little ways north, you can come around, or you go a little over half a mile south of this cut across is basically all it is, and you can get the same effect. Uh, my other problem with it is, is it's not new construction. New construction, from what I've been told, is assessed 100%. And this is just a resurfacing of an existing road, which is, he even said that quite a few times at the meeting the other night. It's not new construction. By no standards is it new construction. It's resurfacing of an existing road that, you know, I shouldn't have to pay for for the convenience of a few people to go cut across. Just leave it gravel and pave it. I mean, grade it, and if they don't like driving on gravel, go a half mile down the road and go across on the other one. I mean, there's it, it serves... All it is is a convenience from having to go down a little ways further and cut across and go up a little ways further and cut across. It, it services no homes. And the assessment area to the north, it's tw they assess twice as far to the north as they do to the south. And I understand that because there's more houses there to help pay for it. You know, but my argument would be to not even not do the project. Just grade the road, and the few people that use it uh, can drive on the gravel. If they don't like driving on the gravel, go half mile down the road and cut across on the other one. I mean, and it's to assess 100% of a repave, that just doesn't seem fair. I mean, it's not new construction. It's a resurfacing of an existing road. New construction would be redoing, you know, building a road and redoing it. This is just a resurfacing of an existing road. I, and like I said, for me to have to pay 100% of something that is convenient for a few people, when, you know, close the road off, tell them to go down the road a half mile and go across on that pavement. You know, there's not, it's not you know, if there was a hospital across the road there and there was no other way to get there, I could see it then. But it's, it's you know, you could close it off and it wouldn't affect anybody because they could go down the road a little ways and cut across or up the road a little ways and cut across. So I would argue that you just not do this and just grade the dang thing. And if they don't like the gravel, tell them to go down the road a ways. Well, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, maybe Tom can explain one more time why new construction or new road is your definition. Okay, and it's so it's not a repave. It's yeah, it's not a resurfacing. I it's to me if if it's a gravel road, resurfacing a gravel road is adding more gravel to it, and that would not normally be assessed. This is improving it by paving it with asphalt, so it's a new improvement that way. Um, and so and the other thing is. 
as it turns out in this case, it's a relatively inexpensive road because we don't have to do anything with the gravel. It's just a shape and pave. And so, frankly, if we used our policy for a mill and overlay of a collector street, the assessment rate is $500 per equivalent lot, which is actually what we used to generate the 100% cost in this case as well. So, whichever way we assess it by the policy, it's still going to be $500 per equivalent lot. So I guess in, in that sense, it, it probably doesn't matter either. So. Council member. Oh. She was first. Well, okay. I've already had a chance to. Okay. Council member Dahlquist. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so when we are putting more gravel on it, or what is the maintenance cost for that road right now? And then it compare it to yeah, if we were yeah, to. I got Okay, yeah, so uh, Public Works has an agreement with Clay County to do the maintenance on the few gravel roads we have, and $900 a year is what the city currently pays for the blading. Does that include a little touch-up gravel, or is that just blading? No, that's just blading. We, okay. It's more yeah. gravel than we have to provide that, so I don't have that cost yeah. on hand. It's probably yeah. $1,000 a year or $2,000 a year of gravel. Okay, so, so anywhere, maybe two to 3000 a year total cost. Okay, and that's with the snow removal too. Snow removal is included in that nine hundred dollars. Just winter and summer maintenance. Okay. One mile stretch of full maintenance that we give Lake County. Okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> let me ask a question real quick, and I'll pass it to uh, Councilmember Durant. Uh, you spoke earlier, uh, Mr. Trowbridge, about uh, my apologies, my mic. <laughs> Still a newbie. Uh, you spoke uh, earlier about people were generally receptive or generally agreeable. Uh, what was the feedback or what has been the feedback you've got from people regarding this project? I know I've heard from at least a couple of people uh, this year supportive of us doing the project. And I, I haven't written down names of who said what, but I, I, I know I've had a couple of comments this year favorable to it. Ever since annexation, I know we'd periodically get a phone call saying, when are you going to pave that road? Which is why it got included in the, in the CIP, is we've had, you know, and it's not like we've had a lot of requests for it, but we've had requests, which is, I, I don't usually get requests to do any of the projects that I do, so it, it's it's hard to say how much support there is for it. But that's the purpose of the public hearing. The, you know, we sent a mailed notice, and you know, I guess what we've had is some in favor and and at least one against. And beyond that, I, I, I it's hard to say what the public sentiment is. I may have a follow-up, but I'll pass it to Councilmember yeah. Duran if you or, and then Carlson. Sorry. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, would there be any? You, you mentioned that the road will flood if at 37 feet or, or high, okay. higher. Is other than that, is there any harm done by leaving it as is? This this road, it's it's just it's a gravel road, so. You know, it's people's preference. In an urban setting, it's now in the city. We don't, I mean, uh, Steve is geared, Public Works is geared towards maintaining paved roads. So the few gravel roads we have are a little bit more of a nuisance for them. It, it's, to, you know, it's not like it's a huge expense. It, it, it is what it is. The, as far as 43rd Avenue North, it is, if the river gets above 37 and a half or 38 feet, uh, Oakport Street floods to the south and it floods to the north and so everybody that's south in the, the south part of that assessment area that's shown that is their only way in and out there's no other road that gets in and out now it's gravel it, it, it functions that way and it's this is high enough up it'll still be a solid road at that point but it is the only way in and out in a flood event for some of those people for, mo for all of the people in the housing that's north, they actually would have to go up to Wall Street because the, the part where it floods is between them and 43rd Avenue North. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Carlson. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you had, or Mr. McCall had uh, mentioned grading the road, and I used to live up in that part of Moorhead, and I know that sometimes they would grade it. How frequently does that have to occur for it to maintain the smoothness versus the that <laughs> the, ripple effect, which is the horrible to drive effect. on? Yes. That's probably every couple of weeks, and depends on the rain, I think, too. Yeah, it does, it, it, and it. it Depends on weather. We also do, I forgot, we do calcium chloride treatment for dust control. Um, but basic consensus of this is that between, it's a combined effort between, I pay Clay County to do this because they have motor graders, more motor graders than I do, and they're up in those areas doing grading anyway. So it's cheap, more cost effective for them to do it for me. We have sent our motor graders up there to augment because we can't keep it at a level that's acceptable to the customers in all honesty. So I take, since we annexed Oakport in January 2005, we get several calls all season long complaining about the condition of the road. It's a gravel road. It's not paved. It's not going to be smooth all the time. And uh, it's maintained as a gravel road. But it doesn't seem to be an acceptable level of service as it is right now. So that's something to consider as well. We'll still maintain it as a gravel road if the decision is made not to pave it. But uh, I've heard a lot more people that want it paved than who don't, and that's my opinion on this matter. I just more have a, just a comment. I, I I just wish we had uh, more numbers. Like, you know, I'm hearing like a couple people. There's a f people calling, but that's kind of my concern. But I would just throw that out there. I don't have a vote in this matter, but that's just my concern. I'll pass it to Councilmember Hendrickson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, Tom, have you done a car count out there? How many vehicles go on that road? I'm not aware of us having a, a count of the ADT. It's usually hard to do on a gravel road, so we, we haven't bothered doing it. We do have some video uh, counters, and we, we could set them up. I would guess it's a fairly low number, uh, probably under 1,000 cars a day, which would make it uh, most of our typical local streets have that. However, for a gravel road, if you start getting over 100 cars a day, you do have more more maintenance that gets required on it, more frequent blading that's necessary. So, you know, it, it, so even though it might be a low, relatively no, low number for what we consider for urban streets, our urban streets are typically paved as well. So, and it, um, what would be the cost? I mean, JJ brings up a good point here, here, Judd. Um, if we if we did get more numbers. From people who are for this, is is it? What's the delay? Is that going to cost more, or well, <laughs> you, you know where I'm heading? In this in this case, we have not received bids. I'm not waiting on an award. If you wanted to, like for example, we've done this in the past where you could close the public hearing and not take action. You can delay taking action up to six months after holding the hearing <clears throat> before you order. So, you know, if you wanted to do that, we could conceivably send another letter out that notifies the residents that, hey, you know, it's because it's extremely rare for us to get affirmative feedback. We usually get some negative feedback. We almost never hear someone bother to write a letter to us or call us and say, yes, please do the project. It's, it's really rare. It's just the nature of the beast. They tend to assume if we've gone this far, it doesn't matter what they say we're doing it. That's, that's a lot of times is the attitude. So if, if you would rather wait until we get some more feedback, we could send a letter out. That, you know, we could probably do it similar to what we've done with the sidewalk, where we say, you check the box, yes or no, and send it back to us. And we can say if they don't reply, We'll count it as a yes, or we can say to count it as a no, whichever you'd rather have us do. But but for uh, the most part, it's been positive. I I think so. Where I've heard comments, I've heard I've definitely heard, you know, 
a half dozen or so that have been favorable to it. Okay. Thanks, Tom. I tend to agree with uh, Mr. Trowbridge that if somebody, typically in the time that I've been on the council, if somebody is against an improvement or project, we definitely hear about it through emails or citizens to be heard. Uh, if they're in favor of it, uh, no action is is uh, affirmative. And I, I believe that our cost to move this to getting uh, bids is less than $1,000 in advertising, printing, and publication costs. We'd probably have that much money spent in sending letters out trying to get response. So mm -hmm. it, it uh, sure kicks the can down the road a little bit, but then we can make an informed decision on a firm bid. Uh, I think that the, in, in the construction industry, the sooner you get this stuff out for bids, the more competitive they are because people are trying to fill out their schedules. And so I, I would encourage us to uh, consider moving it forward. And it, so it's my personal opinion. Thank you, Council Member Gertz. Uh, any other comments or questions? Council Member Dahlquist. Um, if we could wait and do a little study to see how much traffic goes on there, I mean, it, just in the short amount of time it would take to do that before we go through with it. I mean, because it, this was kind of an afterthought anyway, right? It wasn't until the end of January or whatever that, that came out. Well, uh Mr. Trowbridge. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been in the five-year CIP for I believe at least two years. I think two years ago we put it in as a 2019 project. So, I mean, we we've been working towards this for a while. Uh, so, I mean, I guess th th there's two ways to proceed that right now that doesn't really commit you to anything. You could order the improvements, but we still don't have a contract to award. That'll be probably in April. Or you could just simply close the hearing and not take action on ordering until we have the bids. But either way, we're still going to have to award the quote. And that would be in April, I expect, probably April 8th. So you could make a decision at that time, ultimately, as well. So I, I think whether you order it now or don't order it now, there's still an opportunity at the time to award the quote that if you don't award the quote, we don't proceed. So I, 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 there's, there's time yet to get some more feedback if you'd like that. Okay. Madam City Manager. <clears throat> Sorry, okay, don't have to repeat that. Um, we, a suggestion, you could order the improvements now, keep it going. In the meantime, we could ask our traffic engineer to do the traffic count study before the bids are awarded and bring that information back to you on April 8th. That keeps it going. It has been in the CIP for a couple of years. The council did approve it December 8th. I mean, everybody, the entire staff is moving along thinking this, we're going because of all those prior approvals. But you still can hold it if you want, but maybe keep it moving. That would be my suggestion. And then order the, um, the traffic count if you want to know that in between. So that information will have to be included in the motion after we close. I would suggest, hearing. yes. Okay. Uh, Council Member Carlson. Mr. Mayor, how much would the traffic count cost? Uh, uh, our traffic engineer has oh. some equipment, so he, he, he likes playing with it. John's done the traffic study. <laughs> Oh, he, has, you know, he, he does, does have numbers. I think it's somewhere in the area of 382. Okay. 300. 300 vehicles a day. Okay. 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 All right. Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. 300 cars on a gravel road, that's quite a bit. It'll tear it up. So I, I think I, I'm in agreement with uh, Council Member Gertz and Tom. I think we should move forward with the improvements. Okay. I just, I was kind of curious what the car count was. I didn't want to make a big, yeah. <laughs> so. But 300 is quite a bit for a gravel road, so yeah. thank you. 
Uh, any other further questions or comments from council? And I'll ask one more uh, time. Is there anyone here in the audience that wish to speak on this public hearing matter? Okay, so I guess that suffices for my twice. Can I get a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Uh, motion made by Council Member Gertz, seconded by Council Member Durand. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, same sign. Public hearing is now closed. And now, is there a motion to vote on the resolution? I move to approve resolution 10A to order improvements and declare intent to assess. Second. Hey, the motion's been made to approve the resolution as stated as in 10 letter A. Seconded, uh, was made by Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Carlson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now we move to uh, number 11, which is a public hearing for the Belsley area, or excuse me, Belsley East Area Street Improvements and Johnson Farms 1st, 3rd, and 4th, and Comstock 6th edition final wearing course improvements. And uh, is there a motion to open uh, the public hearing on this matter? Second. Motion made by Council Member Durand, seconded by Council Member White. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Public hearing is now open on item number 11. Okay, thank you. So this is a project, again, this is multiple projects from within the CIP that we bundled together into one project. And I'm actually doing just one hearing for this because the, the notices that went out uh, worked that way. And we, we did this as one construction contract. So this is a mix of an existing mill and overlay proposal plus the final wear course, which is 100% assessed. So we've got a partial assessed and 100% assessed, but the notices were specific to the properties uh, that were getting those. But So the, this, I'm breaking this into kind of two parts to show. Uh, the Bellsley East area, I believe it was two years ago we did the West area. So from 8th to 14th Street, that was a mill and overlay of an area surrounding Bellsley Boulevard. And now this is the east area of that from 17th to 20th Street. This is an area where the streets are what we call full depth asphalt, which means back in the 1970s and a good part of the 1980s, most of the roads we paved, we just put a lot of asphalt, like eight inches or 12 inches thick directly on the clay. And it doesn't even have gravel under it. Um, but since it's as thick as it is, it holds up reasonably well, but we much prefer having gravel under there now. It drains much better and, and the road should last longer. But in this case, there's enough pavement. It's still recommended that a mill and overlay is the appropriate fix for it. So these were originally constructed 1977 to 1980. The final wear course went on three to five years later. Uh, this is an area where the sidewalk policy was kind of in flux, so sometimes we didn't require them, sometimes we did. And so we've got areas where the sidewalks are very discontinuous. And then the utilities are all pretty new and in good condition. So what we're proposing to do is to do a mill and overlay and to fill in some of those sidewalk gaps. And so per the policy, if there's a continuous sidewalk on one side of the road, We'll le we don't need to do an infill. And that would apply to 17th Street south of Bellsley Boulevard. Uh, that's one where there's a sidewalk all the way on the west side of the road, but there's no sidewalk on the east. So, and it would also apply to the road on the south, uh, 34th Avenue. There's a sidewalk all the way on the south side of the road and no sidewalk on the north side. So we left those out, but there's other areas where there's no sidewalk at all. So 18th Street, we're proposing a sidewalk along both sides of the road there. Bellsley Boulevard has one lot that has a sidewalk. Everything else doesn't. And there's a city park there, too. So 
we're proposing sidewalks on Bellsley Boulevard and then just a little bit north of Bellsley Boulevard to connect to existing sidewalks to close the gap. So there's a lot of sidewalks that would go in and that will close a lot of gaps and make the neighborhoods much more walkable. So in this case, there's not a lot of different property owners because there's a lot of rental out here. So there were 12 properties that received notices for the sidewalk, okay? And we did not receive any responses back. The notice that was sent out was very clear that a no response would be counted as being in favor of the sidewalk. So the project, uh, based on the feedback, we would assume we'll keep everything in per the policy it would take 75% of the property owners to say no for us to take it out of the project. So the proposal is to keep the sidewalks in. The other part of this project, so we bid it together to get a better bid since it's mostly the same type of work, uh, asphalt overlay. And so we're doing the final wear course in two new subdivision areas. Now this part of the presentation is a little different than what was in the council communication and that's because at the time I prepared the council communication, we also were going to do 17th Street from 34th to 36th Avenue South. Uh, and that's kind of embarrassing. We've already done the final wear out there. Mm -hmm. And at the informational meeting, that was one of the questions that was raised and we followed up and it was correct. It's part of the problem of doing a design in the winter when you think <laughs> you know all the answers. We, we thought we knew and it was, it was actually a change during construction because we'd already done the utilities a year before, we thought, well, this road is holding up well, let's just pave the last two inches now. And it actually has worked really well on that road. But usually our utilities and the streets are being constructed in the same year, so we didn't have that option. And that's why most often we leave that final wear course off and wait a few years to do it. And in this case, it's been five years since the Johnson Farms streets were originally paved, and it's been three years I believe since the Comstock 6th was paved. So we're proposing to get the final wear course in place. In, in these subdivisions, the sidewalks are per developer's agreement, so we don't have to do anything there. And then the utilities are all pretty new, so there's nothing proposed that way. Okay. And this just shows where they sit relative to each other. And so again, we had a preliminary design informational meeting for the Bellsley East area part of the project. We did not include this for the final wear because it's not really appropriate for that. Um, now that informational meeting was more for what are we going to change with the design and the final wear is what it is. And at the Bellsley East area, I don't even remember a person at the meeting asking a question specific to that project. We had, I think, a couple of questions subsequent to that, but it's, it's been pretty quiet on what we've heard. Haven't heard any negative feedback. Uh, we also had a sidewalk letter that went out, didn't get any responses on that. We had the public hearing notice that was mailed out. Uh, I'm not aware, it's possible we had calls on that, but I haven't heard of it. And if, if we did, it was probably just uh, how was the assessment calculated. At the informational meeting that we had last week, I, the only question we had was on the overlay part of it. Again, the final wear course where the person pointed out that his street already had the final wear on it. So now this one, so there's two types of assessment rates that will apply to this project. The final wearing course is new construction because it's getting that last lift of pavement on and making the road complete. And so that would be 100% assessed. And then the Bellsley East area is an urban mill and overlay. So per the city policy, we assess $30 per adjusted front foot. So looking just at the Bellsley East area, the total project cost is just under $700,000 based on the bids that we received. That does include, I think it's 50 or $70,000 of some repairs that the city is doing to some manholes on some nearby uh, collector streets. It, it was more efficient for us to bid it as part of this, but that's a city share of the project. Um, but otherwise, we we're, you know, we're assessing about $180,000 out of that project cost. And so there were 41 benefiting properties. The average assessment is about $4,400. The minimum is 540. 
The median, most common assessment, is about $1,140. And then the maximum was $30,000, and that's for that large apartment <coughs> lot. And I think there's something like 140 <coughs> apartments in it, so to put that in perspective. And then the city has a park lot that gets an assessment on this. So financing-wise, the city share of this project would require a debt levy increase of $33,740 per year, which would equate to a $1.69 tax increase on the median value home. For the Johnson Farms Comstock's final wearing course, uh, based on the mailed notice, and I've already subtracted out the 17th Street cost of this now, based on the mailed notice, we thought it would be maybe $108,000. We got very good bids, so the actual assessment assessing 100% of the cost would be based on the $78,000. So that's maybe 80% of what the mailed notice was, to put it in perspective. And we had different rates. Comstock's is commercial, so we were assessing that on an acre basis. Johnson Farms apartment was assessed on a front foot basis. And then the other front footage cost was actually assessed on an equivalent lot basis because there's some twin lots and some single family lots. And that's how the developer's agreement, how, how the rest of those lots had been assessed, so it's consistent. And there's no postponed or deferred specials for that one. So, and then this, in this case, I'm looking at the two, I'm looking at Johnson Farms separate from Comstock 6th, just so you can see what the special assessments look like. In Johnson Farms, it's the uh, large apartment lot has the $41,000 assessment. Uh, Comstock 6th, it's the Muscatel dealership, which is a very large lot, has the $19,000 assessment. Uh, otherwise, the average assessments were in the $4,000 to $8,000 range for these. Okay, and so then again on the final wearing course, this one would have no impact on the debt levy. And schedule wise, we've received the bids, so after closing the hearing, if you order the improvements, we would ask you to award the bids, and project would be constructed sometime this summer. And then we'd hold an assessment hearing in the fall. So tonight, what we want you to do after closing the hearing is we'd like you to consider uh, ordering the improvements and awarding the bids. Thank you, Mr. Trowbridge. Okay. Any uh, comments or questions for Mr. Trowbridge? Okay. Then uh, I will ask uh, people in the audience, is there anyone here in the audience that would like to speak on this public hearing matter? Is there anyone here in the audience that would like to speak on this, pub on this public hearing matter? Seeing none, can I get a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Motion made by Councilmember Duran, seconded by Councilmember Carlson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. We are now closed in public hearing. Then is there a motion for the resolution in this matter, which would be item 10, I'm oh, sorry, 11, 11 A and B. B, A, A and B. So moved. Second. Uh, motion made by Council Member Duran, seconded by Council Member Hendrickson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, then we move on to item number 13 on the agenda, which is a resolution to approve amendment number one to the project partnership agreement for the Fargo-Mohead Metropolitan Area Flood Risk Management Project. Uh, Mr. Shockley. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, tonight I'm going to play engineer on TV since it's under the engineering department section. Um, so before the city council tonight is a no-cost amendment to the uh, uh, project partnership agreement that is between the non-federal sponsors of the city of Fargo, Moorhead, the Diversion Authority, and the Army Corps of Engineers. 
substantively, the agreement increases the amount of federal participation in the project from $450 million in 2015 dollars to $750 million uh, in uh, 2015 dollars, uh, which uh, is what was requested by the non-federal sponsors uh, when a group of the elected leaders, including the mayor and council member Paulson, traveled to uh, D.C. Uh, and provided a copy of the proposed uh, PPA amendment. Uh, tonight's action is just simply to increase the amount of federal participation. Uh, there is no local tax share that is due. Uh, for those uh, new members of the council in 2016, as alluded to in the city council communications, the city of Moorhead, uh, along with the other uh, members of the Metro Flood Diversion Authority, negotiated a new joint powers agreement specific to that joint powers agreement is that the Minnesota share for capital costs associated with construction uh, is capped at no more than $100 million and that amount is to be paid only from Minnesota legislative appropriations and so there's no responsibility for a local share whether that's out of general taxes or special assessments or some other type of fee. It just, it's just limited to what the legislature can provide. Uh, there are obviously a lot of steps left in the process for the project. Um, you'll recall back and referenced in the city council communications, uh, the two governors, uh, Governor Dayton uh, and Governor Burgum, uh, formed a task force uh, after the project received an injunction from the federal court. Uh, that task force uh, met uh, for what I consider to be unprecedented number of times in which two governors of two states met together all day uh, to work out the details. Uh, the city of Moorhead was represented on that uh, uh, governor's task force with council member Durand and former uh, mayor uh, Del Rey. Uh, and so this is really the first step uh, in following the issuance of the permit from uh, Minnesota DNR. Uh, we really have three major things to resolve before we move forward with the project. Uh, one was achieving a permit from the Minnesota DNR for Plan B. Uh, the second is uh, achieving uh, making the project financeable, uh, and that includes a request from the federal government to increase their share. Uh, and currently we are working with the North Dakota legislature to increase the state of North Dakota's share. Our current request is to increase their share by $300 million. Uh, and once the financing is in place, uh, then the final step will be resolution of the federal litigation. Uh, so there are many actions that are still needed to complete the project. This relates to increasing the financing only. Once again, there's no cost share or responsibility on the side of the uh, city of Moorhead. Uh, and that's specifically outlined in the Joint Powers Agreement. I can certainly answer any questions you might have tonight, but uh, I would uh, like to congratulate the mayor. It's a big win for the project, getting that much money. I mean, I don't ever remember getting $300 million before, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely say it, it, it is a first for myself as well. But, <clears throat> but I will say I want to uh, give a... Uh, a big shout out to our team, uh, uh, Council Member Joel Paulson, as well as uh, Dr. Bob Zimmerman, who accompanied um, me on that trip. Uh, it was uh, really good to sit down and meet and tell our story uh, to the uh, federal uh, dignitaries. And so, you know, I felt like it was a pretty successful trip overall. So I want to definitely send them a shout out. Uh, are, are there any uh, questions or comments, uh, Council Member Gertz? So a vote yes tonight says we'll accept the 300 million, additional 300 million from the federal government. That is correct. That if you vote tonight, yes, you'd be accepting the 300 million. With no strings attached. Uh, it's an amendment to the PPA, which was already signed. So it's an increase of 300 million. Uh, we had asked for it to be in 2015 dollars. Uh, and uh, the, they granted our request in its entirety. and. Uh, maybe emphasizing the $2,015 is important because that means the $300 million is escalated from 2015 forward. So that, that's a big deal. We already, it's actually more than $300 million. So there's really no downside. <laughs> I, I don't know of one, but I, uh, okay. we, we did have a, a question uh, and maybe just to get it out on the rec record. Uh, this decision tonight does not involve the use of 
uh, any type of eminent domain or any any land purchases or anything those are all decisions that have to be decided later uh, we are currently working on an agreement with clay county uh, that would create a negotiation team so to speak between the county uh, the city and a member of the buffalo red river to negotiate out sales of uh, property uh, and acquisitions that would occur in minnesota um, and the purpose of that group is just to negotiate those deals because when you're going to have an appraiser out there, appraiser is going to give you a price. The landowner may come back and say, I want this much. or, And ultimately, there has to be a group that says yay or nay to those negotiations. Uh, if they're unable to uh, come to a deal, uh, properties that would be outside the city would be referred to the county for additional action. Any properties inside the city would be referred to the city council. And that's generally how it's set up. But tonight's vote has nothing to do with that. They're two separate issues. I would uh, move that we approve Amendment 1 to the Project Partnership Agreement uh, for the increase of $300 million. Motion made by Councilmember Gertz. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Dahlquist. <laughs> Everybody okay? <laughs> <laughs> no worries at all. Uh, all in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I believe that moves us to item number 16. And that was the item that was taken off consent. And this is the item for resolution to approve easement vacations in Annette's first edition. So, Mr. Mayor, we have our uh, city planner here. Um, Robin will talk um, or be available to answer any questions, and maybe Councilmember White can explain her question. Sure. And if, Robin, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure if we met personally, but can I get your last name, too? Hi. Uh, good <laughs> evening. I'm, uh, my name is Robin Houston. Houston, okay, very yep. nice to meet you. Just like the city. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so how do we, how, how do you want to start with Miss? Start with me? Councilmember yes. White, sorry. Thank you, Mayor Let Judge. Me yeah, I'm the one that asked to have it off the consent agenda. And thank you very much for coming to the meeting. And just uh, more, I wanted to just have a little bit of discussion about um, the project and how it might impact the adjoining neighborhood. And so we're looking at an easement vacation um, that would allow for this large expansion of Eventide in the southeast corner. And, and really the reason that I brought it up is because I know that that it, it abuts an older neighborhood that tends to has it has has a history of um, some issues regarding their sanitary sewer some of their water and so in particular I know there was recently um, a failure of the sewer system that resulted in backup into houses so some houses had their basements filled with raw sewage and so I I wondered I know that in order to do this we're you know one of the things that the Planning Commission was looking at is the is whether this would negatively impact the areas around it and so I, I wanted us to talk about that a little bit more have we looked at um, for a project of this scale as they're you know, uh, as we're bringing that into the neighborhood, um, there's a lot of beneficial things, but how might that put additional strain and what are we doing to assess that, how, you know, that additional strain on what already is a, seems to be an area that's prone to problems, um, how that might adversely affect the neighborhood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. To, I'm not sure if I can answer your questions because they haven't submitted um, building plans. We haven't gotten to that part of the project yet. Um, I believe they're submitting mid-April. So I've only seen um, very preliminary sketches mm -hmm. of what the addition will be. I know it's um, at least three stories above ground and I think they're also planning a below grade garage. So there's going to be some um, parking issues addressed. Um, as for the capacity I don't believe that's been reviewed yet because we haven't gotten to that part of the project. Mm -hmm. We just reviewed, you know, what was in the existing easement. Um, it's a former alley that was vacated some years ago, and there are um, private and public utilities, and they may need to relocate something for the um, the office building to the north. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the the sewer that's in the easement right now for the Eventide that's their sewer. So I don't, um, I, I apologize, I don't think I can answer that question about the capacities. 
Yeah, and I realize that my question was probably broader than, mm -hmm. but but if we are approving it, I just to me it was thinking about uh, this is the first step of approving a project where we really, I think, want to look carefully at how it might impact the neighborhood. And again, particularly given the history um, of things that have happened in that neighborhood, um, because we've got already quite a bit of strain on the system, it appears. And so I would, I, you know, I, I would strongly encourage us to get some more information just to look at it carefully and think about how we would plan for that i don't want to you know um it's not that i'm expressing opposition to the project by any means but just it's one of the it uh, you know i think we should really make sure that we're looking at that carefully of how we might mitigate some of that and work with the folks at eventide to make a project that will be beneficial for um, you know, for them as well as um, not harming the neighborhood. Correct. And we would, um, mm -hmm. during the site planning process, when the building permit is uh, eventually submitted, that goes to all departments so that the engineering department rev would review those capacity issues then. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is there any other further comment or any questions for Ms. Houston? Uh, seeing none, is there a motion on the table to approve the resolution? Uh, motion made by Councilmember Carlson, seconded by Councilmember Duran. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Ms. Houston. Thank you. I believe that moves us down to item number 20. Mr. Mayor, Steve Moore from Public Works can explain this, right, Steve? Yes. Thank you. So for the public, it's a resolution to approve an amendment to Joint Public Works Facility Agreement with Clay County and MnDOT. So quick background, we have a facility down south just off of 34th Street called the Joint Public Works Facility that's shared by the City of Moorhead, Clay County, and MnDOT. And we have a 30-year agreement which began in 2003 that was a correction um, it was signed by the county and city in 2002 and then signed by the state in 2003 so the effective date was 2003 so this contract uh, amendment will go through 2033 so there's a correction on the council communication it says 2032 and it should be 2033 so we clarified that uh, after talking with MnDOT so essentially this is a good thing it's in support of um, in my, it's in my operational plan, supports strategic initiative of infrastructure, the goal to provide comprehensive and effective city facilities and land management, and the specific objective is reducing our O&M costs for city facilities by 10% by 2020. Um, and what this does is it really clarifies a lot of, uh, of things that were outlined in the agreement that were kind of nebulous, and there were some inconsistencies in how we were charged for our use of that facility. So we own 22% of the facility. We occupy now, after 15 years, we, we've changed how we used it. So instead of occupying 22%, we now occupy only 16%. A lot of it is warm storage for our equipment, and we own some of the salt shed, salt sand shed, as well as uh, the wash rack. So what we've done is where we've been charged two things there's a whole bunch the, there's a summary of changes there's nine revisions but the two most important ones are that it reduces uh, our cost for some things like janitorial and ff&e furniture fixtures and equipment to be reflective of our occupancy rate which is 16 percent so that's been reduced from 22 percent to 16 percent so there's a six percent savings there and then more importantly uh, it charges o and m uh, based on ownership. So there were some things that were split a third, some were not. Um, so O&M for the main facility and complex is, is spread out by ownership, so that's 22%. We do own a third of the salt sand shed, so that'll be still, we cover a third of those costs, and then we use a, a third of the wash rack. So those are the two differences. So we'll have 33% of O&M if it's, if it's to those two things, the salt shed and the wash rack, as well as capital improvements. The second, other than O&M, is capital improvement. In the past, past 15 years, we've been 
um, supplying one third of all capital improvement costs. Now it's going to be based on ownership, which is 22%. So now we see 11% reduction in the future of our contribution to capital improvements of that facility. So in a nutshell, we're going to save some money for the city. Um, kind of an example, in the last five years, uh, between janitorial, FF&E, I, there's a lot of other expenses, but I wanted to use a couple examples. And then capital improvement over the last 15 years, or five years, uh, we could have saved $16,000 roughly. So, and there's other savings in there. Um, but it's really good. It's been a good effort between Clay County, us, and, the, and MnDOT to really, uh, you know, restructure this agreement based on how the facility is being used. So, I'll entertain any questions. I would anticipate since we're saving money, there's not going to be any issue <clears throat> with this. So, um, I'll ask for a motion to approve the resolution. Uh, motion made by Councilmember Member Gertz, seconded by Councilmember Watson Curry. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We move on to uh, agenda item number 21, which is a resolution to approve purchase agreement for sale of city property at 2604 8th Avenue North, parcel number 58.900.0220 to Commonwealth <laughs> Development Corporation of America. Mr. Mayor, this item is the one we discussed in executive session a few weeks ago, or a few meetings ago, I think. The parcel on 8th Avenue where the, um, the, the, the pond will go um, eventually in the corner there. So Christy Zlaszewski from Community Development is here and Aaron from Commonwealth is here. And um, I'll have Christy introduce the item and then Aaron can absolutely, can, can either speak to it or answer questions, whatever she prefers. And we've had a very nice meeting between the county the city and Commonwealth as we plan for this. So I wanted you to know this has been a really good partnership but with everybody so far. So Christy. Thank you, Chris. The request before you tonight is to consider authorization for the mayor and city manager to enter into a purchase agreement and other related documents related to the sale and development of 2604 8th Avenue North with Commonwealth Development. The property is currently owned by the city, as Chris noted, um, resulting from the construction of 8th Avenue North Street Project and has been advertised for sale for residential development since 2012. The property to be sold is approximately 141,410 square feet as the city will retain the area for the stormwater pond as well as the public bike and pedestrian path. The proposed project is a 46 unit multifamily building and would provide affordable housing uh, one of the comments that the council had during executive session was to see if there was any draft site plans or building renderings available, and those are in your packets on page 193 and 194. Staff from Commonwealth, the city, Clay County, and various service organizations, as Chris noted, met on March 6th to discuss the project. It does require application to Minnesota Housing Finance Agency in June, with the agency selecting final projects in October. A quick outline of the proposed terms which are within your packet. Uh, proposed purchase price of $2.90 per square foot plus the existing special assessments. $5,000 in earnest money. A closing date of July 2020 or before. Fencing and landscaping screening between the proposed building site and the Regal Estates neighborhood to the south. Up to three 30-day extensions. And I will note that the, the draft purchase agreement that is in your packet has been um, slightly modified. Um, John Shockley has been working with legal counsel from Commonwealth, and so some of the um, reverter language that was in the one in your packet um, has changed. Um, I do have a strike through version if you would like to see it, um, although I do feel um, based on John's comments that he was comfortable with the changes that they had made. Um, as Chris noted, Aaron Anderson, the Vice President of Development, is in attendance, and we are able to um, answer any questions that you might have. I don't necessarily have a question. I, looking at the drawings, it looks like a very attractive building. Uh, I think in all communities, it's always hard to find affordable housing for um, residents that need that, I think it would be a great addition to the city of Moorhead. So thank you for choosing our community to um, uh, do this project. And I know that maneuvering through all the paperwork 
to uh, get all the approvals for um, your tax credits and funding is not an easy task, so I appreciate your tenacity in, uh, in doing that and improving our community. I second what Council Member Gertz said. Council Member Dahlquist. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was wondering who's going to be managing the property? We do have our own um, property management company. Sorry, um, introducing myself, Aaron Anderson with Commonwealth Development. Um, we do have a, a property management company and we are considering bringing our own property management company here. We do have a, a development in Fargo that would be a good complement to this um, to allow us to have a full-time position. In the short term, um, we may work with a local, a current a local pro property manager called Metro Plains Management for the first couple years. Um, but uh, we're still kind of trying to sort that out, kind of weigh those options out. But those are the two things we're considering, either Metro Plains management or managing it ourselves. Madam City Manager. Mr. Mayor, City Council, I did mention this to Aaron the other day, and I wanted to point out that um, recently I went to a training at the League of Minnesota Cities, and they talked about um, affordable housing, trying to get it to your community as the city leaders. And um, they were very, um, this was before I even realized that this was a development, that they were very um, positive and encouraging about, um, about a developer called Commonwealth which is this developer, and how they, um, they they are very easy to work with. They really engage the community. Their product is is very, very nice, and they follow through, and they do exactly as they say. I think one indication of that is that they are offering us full price for the land, or a good price, let me put that, a good price for the land is $410,000, 75% per our city policy. will go to include um, or to improve those red-rated items, and then 25% goes into a fund of that 410000 into a fund to help with further economic development that we need in the city of Moorhead. So all of those are positives. Um, the developer it has great references and recommendations. And Aaron's been great so far speaking with our staff and all of us and kind of answering all our questions, including the county. The county had an awful lot of questions, great questions um, about, you know, what's going to be for the, you know, part for the, the low income or for the affordable housing and how would it work, right? And then some right. accessible handicap accessible um, can you talk a little yes, bit about that sure I can certainly do that and thank you very much for for those words um, so out of the 46 units where we are looking at targeting 10 of the 46 units as permanent supportive housing and um, currently we believe uh, out, out of those 10 four of them would be targeting formerly homeless families and individuals and six would be targeting disabled uh, folks and um, that's that's kind of based on some feedback <clears throat> excuse me uh, from our partner um, with in lakes and Prairie's Community Action Partnership that would be providing services for those units, um, as well as some comments that the County Human Services Department had, as well as um, the, the Housing Authority, as to what's needed in the community. And so the programming for those units is really the outcome of, of that, that feedback that I've received. Um, and so the, that's what we have planned for those 10 units. And then, um, the, re the remaining 36 units are all at, at rents that are at the 50% county median income level. And so um, what that means is, for example, a two bedroom unit would be $750, a three bedroom, $849. And we actually have some four bedroom units planned here uh, as well. Um, we have six four bedroom units planned, which would be $923. So um, it's really meeting a, a, a large family need as, as we're seeing that there aren't a lot of apartment units um, in that category in the market. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I want to piggyback on what Council Member Gertz said. I mean, that's uh, definitely a great thing for our city. And uh, so thank you for, con for considering us and 
That's just great to hear. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Are there any uh, other uh, questions or comments? Councilmember Dalquist. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I did do a little research, and I did see that building you did in Mandan, and it was fabulous. Oh, the, the adaptive reuse of the, the middle school. Yes. 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 Thank you. Mm. So is there a motion to approve the resolution? Move. Second. A uh, motion made by Council Member Gertz. A tie. I'll give it, uh, <laughs> I'll give it to Council Member Hendrickson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much for your Thank support. You. So I believe we're at uh, item number 23. We're getting there, yes, Mr. Mayor. I'm Joshua Huffman is here from city staff and he's gonna give the report. Thanks, and this, Josh. And this is uh, the uh, accepting the Human Rights Commission 2018 annual report. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you for having me tonight. I uh, just wanted to go through the report and highlight some of the things that uh, occurred during 2018. Uh, sorry, we had our uh, chair, uh, Mikhail Pauline Norman, in here to, uh, to help present as well. Uh, she was here for a couple hours, but then had to leave. Uh, so I apologize, it's just me this evening. <laughs> Uh, in 2018, uh, the Human Rights Commission uh, focused on education and awareness, uh, local partnerships, public relationships, and leadership. Uh, there were some educational community activities that occurred throughout the year. Uh, the commission partnered with Softel uh, to provide and record a fair housing training in April. Uh, the commission participated in the League of Minnesota Human Rights Commission's essay contest by soliciting submissions from area students and uh, selecting one to forward uh, to the LMHRC for judging in, uh, in June. The uh, commission hosted a booth uh, at the FM Pride in the Park event in August. The uh, commission participated in welcoming week events that were held uh, the week of September 14th through the 23rd. And uh, most recently, the commission solicited nominations for Human Rights Awards. Uh, they were uh, they awarded the 2018 Human Rights Awards to Izad El Haider and Faria Ali. Uh, Will Yellowbird uh, presented those awards to the recipients at the City Council meeting in December, um, which was also on International Human Rights Day. Uh, throughout the uh, monthly meetings in 2018, there were a number of educational presentations with guest speakers. Uh, Kara Glow and Cassie West from Welcoming Committee, uh, as well as Michael Sargent, came on a couple different dates uh, to discuss their events and how the HRC could participate uh, and assist in that. Uh, Mayor at the time, Delray Williams and Rick Henderson, uh, participated in a discussion on the history and the future of the HRC, uh, as both of them had formerly been chairpersons of the HRC. Uh, city employees Tia Braseth and Kim Sotrowski uh, discussed the impact of the upcoming census uh, on Moorhead and Minnesota at large. Uh, Martha Castanon from the Immigrant Law Center shared information on her work uh, with immigrants in the community. And uh, Don Duncan from Concordia shared information on the Narrative for uh, Concordia program, which was a, a story sharing program. Uh, there were a couple membership changes. Uh, Commissioners uh, Abdullahi and Yoni uh, resigned in, during 2018, uh, and a newly appointed Commissioner Kani Aden joined in 2018. There were 10 meetings uh, in the year, and those uh, minutes and videos of those can be viewed on the Human uh, Rights Commission webpage, which is on the city's webpage. And there were no subcommittees in 2018. Any questions or comments for us? I, I know Sarah would probably be a, a big help. I would just say thank you for your work. Oh, does someone raise their hand? Yes. Okay, sorry. No, you can go first. No, I just want to say thank you for your work. It, this was the first commission that I served on, so I know it's uh, very important work that you do in the community for education. So, I mean, thank you for your service as well as the rest of your commission as well. Council, Council Member White. Yes, and th thank you, Josh. And and I also wanted to just recognize that we, they brought back the Human Rights Award. And so um, I was really pleased. That I'm not sure how many years it was on a hiatus, but it was nice to have that back again. <coughs> Council Member Watson Curry. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So I, I know that uh, uh, Council Member White is now the council liaison to the, to the Human Rights Commission, which is fabulous. And uh, it's great to see all the efforts that have taken place under its first complete year of, of being reiterated again. So great work. And I, I know that there's a lot of really great relationships that are being built amongst the commissioners and the community at large. So thanks to them. Any other uh, comments or questions? So resolution to accept the commission report, a annual report. So moved. <laughs> Fitting. So <laughs> motion made by Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Watson Curry. All in favor say motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Number 24, which is a resolution to support the Chamber of Commerce membership. Uh, Madam City Manager Volkers. Um. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, you'll see in your packet there is a request to um, approve support of this. It isn't absolutely necessary right now. I've, I've already asked the Charter Commission to consider changing the charter to allow for um, the city and MPS to be members of the Chamber of Commerce. You have the legal materials in your packet. In summary, um, there's an Attorney General opinion, and or was it State Auditor? Um, I think it was both, and um, L League of Minnesota Cities, in addition to our own city process, or city attorney, all stated that it is um, not legal and appropriate to be members of the Chamber of Con Commerce for um, cities unless they have an explicit right or statement that they may be members. So our charter is silent on the issue. Um, the way around that is to get the charter changed to allow us to be members of the Chamber of Commerce, I believe my opinion, and I'm recommending approval is that it is very important that we be members. They do a lot of um, advocacy on legislative issues for us. We get a lot of benefit from being members. There's a lot of events we participate in. They do support us in many ways, more and more all the time. And so I do think it's important for Moorhead to be a member. All the surrounding cities are members of the Chamber of Commerce. So the Charter Commission next week will consider this issue and they have to first recommend approval which will come to the council. The only way the charter will be changed in that situation is if there is a unanimous, unanimous vote of the council in addition to the mayor voting in the affirmative to get the charter changed. Is that correct? So I will answer any questions that you have. Council Member White. I do, I support our involvement with the chamber and I think it is beneficial. My question was, we're paying three memberships. So is that, is that typical for a city? Uh, do we have to have three separate memberships? Council member White, um, boy, that's a loaded question. Do we have to? Absolutely not. The city of Moorhead is the city of Moorhead. However, there is a belief by um, Moorhead Public Service that they want their own membership. That is something I intend on talking to them about. And then the EDA, that is a separate membership on purpose because for economic development reasons, they can have a membership and support their local chamber, and that actually is legally allowed. So we don't need the council approval on that one. So I would suggest that we continue to keep the EDA membership separate. Um, MPS and the city, in my opinion, should be merging our membership into one because there is one city of Moorhead. But I have to discuss that with MPS yet. So, thank you. Council Member Gertz. I totally support um, the change to the charter to allow it to us to be members. I think uh, the Chamber of Commerce is an important um, organization or, that promotes our, all of our communities, and uh, they've been a great partner. Um, they're a tenant in one of our buildings, and um, I, I think it would be a real positive. Uh, uh, sign to them that uh, we're all in. Council Member Dahlquist. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I disagree. I don't think that we should go against the League of Min uh, Minnesota Cities, um, the Attorney General's ruling on this. Um, it's not that we are not going to work with the Chamber, but um, I also believe that they they have these eggs and issues that multiple members go to from the city council and they're also charged for that um and i just i think it's best to keep it separate we it's not like we're not going to work with the chamber 
but I just don't believe that we should be members, being that this Attorney General has ruled that that's not what the city should be doing, is being a member of the chamber. Count or Mr. Shockley, city uh, attorney. Thank you, M Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the request before the city council is to ask this uh, charter commission, which can propose amendments to the city charter, to put in place an amendment that would allow the city to be a member of uh, the Chamber of Commerce. The AG has opined that absent a charter that allows that provision, you could not be a member. So what is really the, the question is whether or not you want that authority and even if the authority is set forth in the charter, there's still a second decision for the city council regarding whether you want to authorize that authority. So the, what's before the council tonight is just, do you want to ask the charter to include it as charter commission to in, propose an amendment to the charter that would allow you as a city to become a member of the chamber? So maybe this is a clarification point. So the we're asking the Charter Commission to consider it, correct? Correct. But they also could consider it and not, well, go along with it, is what you're saying? Correct. So we're just merely asking them to consider it and then the end result go, comes from the Charter? Yep. Okay. And, and then it, it comes back to, so if they recommend the Charter Amendment, then it comes back to the city council to vote on it anyways. So you know it begs the question, what if they don't recommend it? The city council can still make an amendment to the charter. It's just the process requires them to consider it first and make okay. a recommendation. Fair, en fair enough. Does that beg any questions? Councilmember Gertz. So if our charter had uh, approved it prior, would that, uh, would the Attorney General's opinion be different than what he has given? Yes, the uh, to AG, so maybe a little bit of background. In Minnesota, there are two types of cities. There are charter cities and statutory cities. The AG opined that cities that were statutory in nature did not have the authority to uh, be a member of Chambers of Commerce because it violated the public expenditure of funds. The AG then opined that if you are a charter city, you need specific authorization within your charter to allow you to be a member of a chamber of commerce. So if you have that, if you have that authority, it's no problem. You just need to point, that, point to that authority in your charter. So um, the council asks the charter commission to consider that. They do the homework and, and uh, then would come back to recommendation and, and then we would uh, thumbs up, thumbs down that recommendation with the requirement being unanimous vote. Correct. So had, had the charter said uh, you're, you're welcome to, the attorney general then would, would have agreed that you, you could. Correct. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, to clarify, um, and Council Member Gertz, as I started to say at the beginning that I wasn't going to bring it to you guys because that's not usually how we would do it, ask you for to support something. I d am bringing it to them. I just thought it would be good information for them to have your thoughts on it before they consider it. Either way, it would come back to you at that point then. So, and I am going to ask Mr. Whitney, who is president CEO of the chamber, to speak to both the Charter Commission next week and then to you when it comes to you for consideration. To show, we, I think we need to outline the benefits, or not, to the city. I think you need to have the whole picture. And he is the one most capable of providing that. So right now this resolution going to the Charter would be that <clears throat> we are asking them to consider it on our behalf. That's the bottom line. So. Any other thoughts or comments before we move forward? Councilmember Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I got to ask, um, what if we don't get a majority vote on the council? Then it's not an amendment to the charter, and then you don't have any authority to do it. But we're still member of the members of the uh, Fargo-Marty Chamber of Commerce? Uh, you would have to discontinue have your to membership. Stop. In point of clarification, I think, just for <clears throat> Councilmember Duran, it is a unanimous vote. Correct. 
So if it's not unanimous, then we're out of the FM chamber. Yes. Black and white. Okay, thanks. The, the EDA can still be a member because the EDAs have are a separate political subdivision. Okay. Just, I just wanted clarification there, so thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Duran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to make the comment that I encourage our Charter Commission to do their homework, um, to look at um, all aspects, including how much it costs to the taxpayers, um, as well as is it is it an arrangement that the EDA, our, our own EDA, can cover on their own without us having to, or if it they deem it beneficial for the city to also be involved. So I, I would really encourage them to do a very holistic overview of all aspects of membership. Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? So. Motion made by Council Member Hendrickson. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Carlson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign? Aye. Motion carries. And do we need to note? I have it. Okay. Thank you. Dolphus is a note. Number 25, a council and mayor reports. Anyone to offer for the good of the order? Council Member Duran. I just have one real quick one from Park Board. Um, one of the wish list items uh, for our, our city is a south side dog park. And the Park Board voted to approve staff to study River Oaks Point as a potential location for the Southside Dog Park. It meets um, the recommended criteria of trails, barriers, water, uh, water sources, and size. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention that they will, staff will be uh, reviewing River Oaks Point as a potential um, Southside Dog Park. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Watson Curry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I attended, along with Councilmember um, Hendrickson, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee on February 28th. And uh, there's just a lot of planning underway uh, for what some say is the most wonderful time of the year. They're already looking ahead for cleanup week as well as um, Earth Day uh, uh, celebrations. So look for things that are happening at the uh, Moorhead Public Library and countywide as well. And uh, I also wanted to call attention to the <coughs> Um, Center Avenue Improvement Community Open House. I noticed we received uh, a flyer for that, and that was in my calendar as well. So it's Thursday, March 21st from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, at the Moorhead Center Mall. So it's um, giving information about the upcoming um, construction on Center Avenue. So that's all I have. Thank you. Council Member White. I have a few reports from committees. Um, I attended my first meeting of the Clay County Collaborative. Um, and they are planning a, an exciting event for June 12th, and it's called the Dilworth Moorhead Longest Table. And this is a, an event where they're anticipating bringing about over 200 people together. It's going to be at the Dilworth Community Center. Um, it will be an opportunity to bring people from all different um, from both communities, um, you know, uh, all different areas across both towns. And um, we'll have a meal. The Dilworth Lions are providing the meal and have discussions about what's great about our communities, how we can build community more. One of the interesting things about it, and this is in part with the name, the longest table, is so it will be set up so it is one extremely long uh, table and um, there'll be facilitated discussions at each table and then in the end each of the tables will actually be donated to the people that attend the event so that they can take them back to their neighborhoods for things like night to unite and other community events so they want it to then be a way a catalyst for building those conversations and, and within communities and building communities so um, bringing people together um, they, I, uh, I'm serving on the committee, on the planning committee, along with Chris Martin from Moorhead PD. And um, right now, they're working on funding for the event. And so I wanted to bring to your attention that the city of Dilworth is applying for a grant 
um, a community planning grant for $4,000 with West Central Initiative, and they would like our support. They're not asking for us to provide any funds or anything like that or put our name in the grant. They were just um, would like, um, they're looking for our, the other partners to provide letters of support for the project. Just to, um, and so I've spoke with the city manager about that, and, and um, unless there's an objection, that's something that Chris could put together. The grant proposal that they're submitting is going in this week, so it would just be something saying that we support this project, and clearly our involvement shows our support, but um, that would support them in getting the grant um, to help to fund the project. Um, so I'll, I'll move on to the next one unless anyone has any other, any questions about that. Okay. And then um, I attended the West Central Initiative Economic Development District Board meeting, and um, that's a very useful committee for bringing people together throughout the region. We had a lengthy presentation on child access to good child care and um, resources that are available for bringing more um, child care centers to our community. And one of the other things that they offered there as a resource is they actually can, they were willing to come to Moorhead and give a presentation on um, starting more small businesses in your community. And so I'm on EDA and I can bring that there as well. But that's something, again, just looking at some of the resources that they have available that might be beneficial to our community. And then I'll bring up HRC, um, and I might have to have Chris help me with this a little bit. So, um, so we uh, haven't I we haven't had another meeting, but there were some things I mentioned two weeks ago at our meeting that came up at the previous Human Rights Commission meeting um, that I wanted to follow up on. One is that uh, the our uh, staff member Joshua. Uh, Hoffman, right, did send a letter to the landlord that was involved in the alleged case of, uh, alleged incident of housing discrimination, just um, to educate the landlord about policies, um, state and federal policies regarding housing discrimination. Um, one of the, the, a couple of the other recommendations are still in the works, so I think, will they be coming at the next meeting? Do you want to address that? Um, Council Member White, if we could back up just one second. Um, the letter that we did talk to the landlord tonight, oh, good. and the landlord called after receiving the letter. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that he received the letter. He thanked, thanked um, the city for the educational material. He did state, however, that um, he does not recall the conversation the way it was represented, and he believes he was misrepresented in the media, although he was not upset. He thanked us for the information. So that, that loop is kind of closed, I Great. think, at this point. Great. Okay. And then the other items, there are there is action that needs to be taken on them, and I believe they will be coming to the next meeting. Okay, so I'll hold off on those yes. others. So we were looking more broadly at some things that we could do at the city level just to educate other landlords and, and prospective tenants. And so I think those will be coming at our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Carlson. Um, I just want to report on the Lake Agassiz Regional Library, um, which represents seven counties, five cities, and it's one of 12 library systems in the state. Um, in February, they participated in Library Day at the Capitol. Two main priorities of the Lake Agassiz Regional Library, also known as Laurel, um, are supporting a $4 million increase in funding to, for the Regional Library basic system support. Um, for the last 20 years, state funding for libraries has only increased once. Um, and so it's been extremely hard to meet rising costs of services and addressing the needs of um, services in communities. Um, to give you an idea of how many people visit libraries in Minnesota, they drew 23.3 million visitors last year, which was 3 million more than Disney World. The Moorhead Library loan had 195,086 visits and 246,915 items were checked out. Um, the funding bill is also going to hopefully address the outdated formula that's used to determine how much funding each system is awarded, and it fluctuates every year, so it makes um, it really hard to provide any type of budget consistency, in consistency as well as address any inequities in award amounts throughout the state. Um, they also support a bill for an appropriation of $2,500,000 from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund for the regional library systems. They've been recipients of that fund um, in that amount since 2009. Uh, the, bigger, the big one, though, is that increase in $4 million. It's uh, House Bill 1282 and Senate Bill 1704 if people want to follow those bills or contact and lend support. So 
to give you an idea too, what happened with that money um, not being raised is that they were deficit spending, dipping, in to, dipping into resources, and around 2013 had to close on Sundays and reduce hours. In 2014, some of the money was restored. Our Moorhead Library is still closed on Sundays due to that budget um, reduction. Um, other hours have been restored, though. And then the other thing I was going to ask, um, I just wanted to give this impact report. And Chris, I think you could publish this to the website afterwards. That was it. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Councilmember Dahlquist. Thank you, Mayor. I actually had three meetings. One uh, was the public housing meeting. Um, got a report from an independent auditor, and that was approved. Budget committee um, appointments are still in the progress. Um, there were repairs at Riverview Heights. Two boilers broke from the heater, the furnace, <laughs> which requires water in the boilers for heating. Um, it might still be under, or they might still be under warranty because it was less than 10 years. Uh, and then the water heater broke. Um, so they are working on those things. Um, the elevator loan is still in progress. Um, and they are looking at bids for assessments of uh, any of the repairs that need to be done on the public housing facilities. Um, then for Lakes and Prairies Community Action Partnership, which was in Downer, um, we got a Head Start report, which was very positive. The attendance for both students and teachers fell in January, but <laughs> a lot from illness and because of the weather. Um, they approved the purchase of a small vehicle so they don't have to move car seats around. Um, they got the budget um, report uh, in. Um, Oh, and on Giving Hearts Day, they raised 16000 And they are also going to be looking into doing a study about wages for employees, see if they can raise those. So it would be a, um, they'd be able to make enough money to purchase things that they are trying to help people to do in the first place. So um, then we had an MCAM meeting on March 7th. Um, I don't know if you noticed that Tim Tim is gone, and they have a new hire, Cody. Um, they also did the budget, and the website is fixed, and uh, sponsorship will go live on the website pretty soon. Um, they are still looking to see if they can get some students to come in and do uh, camera or do camera for sports events for the Spuds, um, and talk about taping the school board meetings uh, as live stream. That's that's in the progress. Um, and they still offer the, the service of transferring your VHS and eight millimeter films to disc, and it's very reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> um, I'll be, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, very brief with my reports. Uh, when I attended the Professionals of Color event at the Fargo Moorhead uh, Chamber of Commerce, it was a good event, uh, very historic. I uh, saw a lot of re representation from our community uh, that were present. So kudos to the chamber for putting that on and sponsoring it and being a, a foundational component. Uh, many of those things have been tried in the past to get professionals of color in our community uh, available. I think it will be sustainable through the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I think there's a business case, an ethical case for, di for diversity. So I applaud them for doing that. Furthermore, thanks for the community for supporting uh, the Dairy Queen uh, 70th uh, anniversary. That's a big deal. Um, the big deal is because we have businesses here that are in our city that are sustainable. I think that speaks volumes to our community being very supportive, very loyal. Uh, we have a great consumer and residential base, so thank you for everyone for showing up for that. Also spoke at the League of Women Voters on that same day. That was a very busy day. Um, <clears throat> catching up on legislative updates. Uh, that we have going on in Minnesota. I uh, also uh, make sure I'm not missing anything here. Also spoke at uh, the 
Moorhead Business Association regarding diversion activities, gave an update on what's going on. Uh, thank you uh, to uh, the Moorhead Business Association for writing their letter of support uh, regarding the uh, Buffalo Red situation. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, it's going to be a big deal uh, for our city and our business owners to make sure that we have flood protection. And I think that is a quick synopsis of what I think I've done for the last few weeks. Also, kudos to our diversion uh, committee for helping out bringing home the uh, $300 million from the federal government. Any questions, I can answer them. If not, we can move on to Council Member, or so, sorry, Madam City Manager Volgers and her report. No report, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So that brings us to item 27, which will be our executive session, uh, executive closed session pursuant to Minnesota Statute 13D.05, subdivision 3, to discuss the possible sale of real estate adjacent to public work works facility identified as parcel number 58.174.0180. Do I need to also state item B? And also item B under uh, number 27, executive, executive closed session pursuant to Minnesota Statute 13D.05, subdivision 3B, for the purpose of attorney-client consultation regarding issue related to correction of legal title issue relating to city utility easements. With that being stated, can I get a motion to move into executive session? Motion made by Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Watson Curry. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. We will now move into executive session. <laughs> 